So good morning, everybody. Welcome to our first session of the day. Um, our first speaker today is Eyal Ben Eliyahu. Eyal is a historian of Jewish, uh, ancient Jewish history at the University of Haifa. He has published the books Ben Gulot, The Borders of the Land of Israel in the Consciousness of the People of the Second Temple and Roman Byzantine Period, and Identity and Territory, The Jewish Perception of Space in Late Antiquity. Together with Fergus Miller and Yuda Cohen, he published Jewish Literature from Late Antiquity, a handbook. Uh, he also has the project Alma, a digital, digital analytical atlas uh, for the Jewry of the Ancient World, uh, which you can find online at alma.haifa.ac.il. Um, and today he will talk about the impurity of the land of the Gentiles, as a tool for defining the halachic borders of the land of Israel. Thank you. In biblical and rabbinic literature, the boundaries of the land of Israel were void and flexible, rather than absolute. In fact, as we shall see today, certain concepts in rabbinic lit literature were part of the rabbi's efforts to shape and shift those borders. The study of ancient Jewish perceptions of the borders of the land of Israel must begin with the Bible. Biblical literature contains several outlines for the land rather than one explicit boundary. Moreover, the biblical narrative that describes the request of the sons of Reuben and God to settle on the Jordan's east bank, as well as Moses' response, demonstrates that these borders were not fixed and immutable. The principle of void and changing borders also appears in rabbinic literature, which contains two basic outlines, the smaller inner skin, known as the borders of the returnees from Babylon, from Babylonia. And this is the map. Refer to the area that in the rabbi's perception had been settled by the returnees from Babylonia, do, during the Persian period, the wider external system, the border, the border of the Egyptian immigrants relates to the, shape, to, to, the space, to the space settled by the Israelites from Egypt who had entered the land earlier with its conquest by Joshua and who remained there until the end of the second temple period. With that in mind, I would like to illuminate how the concept of the impurity of the land of the nations or the Gentiles in halacha, Jewish law, is used in rabbinic literature as a tool to define the land's territories. The lecture will, will, will be divided into three parts. First, I will explore the, the, the motives and stand behind the decree of the impurity of the land of the nation. The ruling will be examined in the light of two disparate theories put by Dalia Alon and Christine Hayes. I will then discuss the link between the borders of the Babylonian returnees and the impure sp space of the nation's lands. I will claim that the sages wielded the land's purity laws with purpose aiming to expand Jewish settlements. In the lecture's third and final section, I will address the question of, of Pure in gentle cities of young gentle cities. Here we'll see how Rabbi Yudan sees exemptions of such cities and commandments that were dependent on the land alliance and the use of the sages who made it who made it with purity laws. Now to the impurity of the land of the nations, the decree and its purpose. The view of territories outside the land of Israel as impure comes up a number of times in the Bible. The look of Amos, for example, calls the land of the exile impure soil. The tribes located on the western shore of the Jordan describe the territory of the tribe of God and Uven on its eastern bank as unclean. Nonetheless, it is rabbinic literature that first employs a halachic definition of the space outside the land outside of the land of Israel as subject to impurity of the nations. This is a place to note that rabbinic literature is comprised of a number of stages. The first stage, Tanaitic literature, consists of Mishnah and Tosefta, 
edited the land of Israel in the early third century CE. The second, or Amoraic stage, includes that Jerusalem Talmud, Midrash Agada from the land of Israel, and Babylonian Talmud, which was edited in Babylonia in the fifth century. In the rabbinic sources from the land of Israel, the impurity of the land of the nation has great significance. It, shape, it shapes the way space in the land of Israel in, in contrast with the territory that is considered to be outside the land is perceived. The determination that the space or area is subject to impurity of the nation, of the nations lead to a perception of that, of the, of that space as gentle, both practically and more generally, despite the fact that these spaces were at times contained with the biblical borders of the land of Israel. According to the writer in the Babylonian Talmud, right, there's a passage, a quote, and an Amoraic statement from Jerusalem Talmud, the decree of the impurity of the land of the nations is attributed to the first pair scholars in the period of the Zugot or pairs, which extended from the second century BCE to the first century CE. The Talmud states, Yosei ben Yoezer of Sreda and Yosei ben Yohanan of Jerusalem decreed impurity of the land of the nations and on glass. The Dalia alone possesses that these al al were meant to institute a separation between Israel and other nations. But despite the statement in the Talmud determined that this al originated in an earlier period, the, Bers the Persian period. And indeed, Ezra and, Nehemiah, Ezra and Nehemiah, which relates to the earlier period of the sixth and fifth century BCE, contains an important theme, the need to preserve Jewish uniqueness and total separation from the nations of the land. The, stronger, the strongest expression of this, of this segregation is the uncompromising struggle against marriage to non-Jewish women. But this segregation, was not limited to the separation of the, of the diaspora returnees from gentle women, from gentle women. It was also expressed in the refusal to include non-Jews in the construction of the temple in Jerusalem. However, not everyone agrees the decree of the impurity of the nation stems from the desire for separation. Christine Hayes has recently dedicated an extensive discussion to rejecting alone suggestions. In her opinion, the decree stemmed from the fear of the impurity of the, of the of, of dead because the Gentiles do not bury the dead in an organized fashion, rather than the impurity of the Gentiles as alone suggests. This claim accords with general approach to the impurity of Gentiles. They assert that the impurity of the Gentile is not inherent as it can be naturalized through conversion. Hayes claims that Tanaitic sources contain no mention of the fact that the impurity of the land of the nations stems from the presence of non-Jews. In this, they, they continues, they continues the, the, to, the, the, in this, she continues the, the line of medieval rabbis, former Rashi and then Maimonides, who relate, who relate the decree of the impurity of the land of the nations to the possibility of being affected by the impurity of the dead. The rabbinic sources on the, the subject can shed some light on the reasons for the decree. The interpretation that tied the impurity of the land of the nations to the impurity of the dead appears to stem from, the, from a number of Talmudic sources, lists, the impurity of the land of the nations next to the impurity of the dead and the impurity of Bet Hapras. Bet Hapras is a field containing a grave whose specific location is unknown. So, for example, Tractate Nasir attributes impurity of the hanging and the projecting stones and Bet Hapras and the land of the nations and the grave cover and the grave walls and a quarter log of blood and the tent. It's Mishnah Nasir. The impurity of gentle land is listed, is listed between the impurity of, of a bone and the impurity of better class. Both 
constitute impurity of that and all follow the same halachot. It was this proximity that led Hayes, as well as Maimonides and Rashi, to explain the reason behind the impurity of the land of the nations as concern regarding bone secreted in gentle lands, because non-Jews at that time did not bury their dead. But a close examination of the rabbinic sources on the impurity of the land of the nations, I believe, indicates that it is not tied to the impurity of the dead at all. The writer, course, that appears in both Babylonian Talmud and Jerusalem Talmud, links the impurity of the land of the nations to glass vessels. Furthermore, a bright in the Jerusalem Talmud mentions 18 decrees, including the law of the land of the nations, of the eight list of the of the eight listed in the Baraita, seven share a common denominator: segregation from the Gentiles. While all the purity render one impure through direct contact, such as touch, carrying, sitting, etc., only impure only impurity of the dead and purity of the cemeteries and better for us render an entire space impure. In the same way. The space of the land of the nations is impure as a result of a general presence of Gentiles in the space. In the space. Thus, the link between impurity of the land of the nations and the beauty of the dead and better past is not necessarily the result of a shared source, as the Hayes claims, but rather a similar halachic pattern. It is that. It is thus hard to assume, as Hayes does, that the source of the impurity of the land of the nation stems from her regarding the bones of the dead. Alon's opinion that the impurity of the Gentiles meant to create a separation from other nations is the cause of the impurity of the space where Gentiles live outside the land of Israel. This is more, much more reasonable. Than Having established that the most likely reason for the decree of the impurity of the, of the land of the nations, or land of Jedi, is to separate Israel from other nations, we turn to the territorial significance and its national ethnic dimension. Surrounded by, by an area that contains the impurity of the nations, the geographic space of the Jewish dispersion, during the Second Temple period was called domain in which the Babylonian returnees was, were, were held. This was called like that by the sages. This area is discussed in, in detail, in detail brighter known as brighter of the boundaries. Rabbinic literature uses the term the returnees from Babylonia, despite the obvious lack of accord between the domain in which the diaspora returnees settled and the domain out outline in the right of the boundaries. It is clear even in rabbinic literature that according to Ezra Nehemiah, the land which was, in which the returnees from Babylonia settled was limited, Betel in the north, uh, Betsu in the south, and Gedi and Jericho in the east, and Lod and Ono in the south. It's only in the middle, in the, in the region of Judea, while the map that they, that they described is much larger. Thus, the definition of the boundaries of the, of the returnees from Babylonia is not a historical description. description. Rather, it rather, it reflects the domain of the Jewish settlement during the sages' time. But they, they were no, they, they, they wasn't an archaeologist. There were no archaeologists, but, but they knew the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, and they knew that the returnees from Babylonia settled only in Judea, and the map is much wider. It's quite close to the map of the land of Israel today. The, the, characters, the characterization of the Babylonian returnees as separate from the Gentiles around them, as it arises from Ezra, teaches us that the use of the term the domain held by the Babylonian returnees stems in actually from the sage of familiarity with, with Ezra and Nehemiah. The trend of, of ethnic segregation, one of the prominent one of the prominent characteriz characterization of Israel and Chemia infuses the term the borders of the returnees from Babylonia with meaning. Within these borders sits the Holy Seed, a population that is separate from the Gentiles with their impure land. The term the, bo the borders of the returnees from Babylonia is not entirely anachronistic, rather it characterizes the, the space of the rabbis who saw themselves as offerings and spiritual hires of the returnees from Babylonia 
separate from the nations that are around it. The variety of the boundary, which is also found in the Rehov inscription, the Rehov mosaics on the floor of a synagogue south to Bet She'an and dates to the mid first millennium CE, open, opens with a definition, the domain of the land of Israel, the place held by the Jordanians from Babylonia. This halachic frame links the borders in which the ethnos, the Jewish nation sits, and the borders of the land of Israel. The domain in which the Jewish population lives is what differentiate the land that is holy, in which the specific commandments relates to the land of Israel must be kept. This di different from the space around it that is impure with the impurity of the land of nations. The impurity of the land of nations in, in space outside the domain of the returnees from Babylonia emerges from the Allahic status of a space defined in rabbinic literature as Syria. Syria is close to the area, to the area of the Babylonian, the, the Babylonian returnees and Allahically speaking holds an intermediate status, neither land of Israel nor Babylonia. Here we have a map of the province of Syria because it's not simple to define the area of Syria and the rabbinic literature. I think that the area of the Syria and the rabbinic literature is between the borders of the Babylonian returnees, which is the Galilee and the Golan, and the Euphrates. And it's quite equal to the province of Syria, to the provinces of Syria. We can read it into Sefta Kelim. As to three things, Syria is equivalent to the land of Israel. And as three things, it's foreign land. It is in parts impurity like that of foreign lands. And the three things uh, that are equivalent to the land of Israel, the one who buys a field in Syria is like one buys a field in the outskirts of Jerusalem and so on. This domain, despite its proximity to the land of Israel, and its partial correspondence in status to the land of Israel is still considered to be tainted with the impurity of the nation. That's the understanding that the meaning of the borders of the returnees for, of the returnees from Babylonia is the space which the distant Jewish population has its settlement con concentrated, se separate from the Gentile population, puts the laws of impurity of the land of the nations in new light. It is the continuous settlement itself that defines a space as belonging to the land of Israel and free of the impurity of the land of the nations. An examination of the Alchot that are occupied with the purifying the land of the, na of the nations in Syria also teaches us about a trend of, con of encouraging continuity of settlements into Syria. This can also be seen in Tosef Takelim quoted above, the one who buys a field in Syria like one who buys a field in the outskirts of Jerusalem. This approach would encourage the purchases of fields in Syria is found, is found within a series of Tanaitical tenet Chot that includes the following Mishnah as well. If one buys a field in Syria near the land of Israel, if he can enter it in cleanliness, it is deemed clean and is sharp and it's, and it's subject to Tithith and Shvi'id, sabbatical years, but if he cannot enter in cleanliness, it's unclean, but it's still subject, but it's still subject to the Tithith and Shvi'id. This is Mishnah Aron. Sorry, could you explain what means enter in cleanliness? It's a good question. Enter in cleanliness means enter in continuity from the land of Israel. That's what I think, because there is no mechanism here about purifying. This, this is the point, exactly. That purchasing, uh, uh, if you buy him the field or he is, or is cultivate the land there, he made, he made a continuous. And the continuity means to purify. This is the point, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> and it's not like- Territorial continuity. To, exactly, territorial continuity. And not as Rashi, Maimonides, and Kristen Hay thought that there are bones there. If there are bones there, if you want to be clean, you must find the bones. You must clean it from the bones. 
And there is no any condition like that here. Thank you. The Mishnah ties the area that is free of the beauty of the land of the nations to the area in Syria, in which commandments that are dependent on the land obligate obligations that exist only within the land of Israel, such as taking priestly Jews and teachers from popes and letting the land lie fellow in the sabbatical year are required. That is to say, the purchase of a field in proximity to the land of Israel is what causes the field to become part of the domain known as the domain of the returnees from Babylonia, a space in which this is and observing the sabbatical year are required. Such a, such a field's obligation in Tithes and sabbatical years is linked to its status to a free of the impurity of the land of the nations. Moreover, the Mishnah does not note any type of test necessary to purify the field from the impurity of the land of the nation. Purification is rather affected by the purchase and the possibility to enter it in cleanliness. The creation of continuous territory and taint with the impurity of the land of the nation from the land of Israel to spaces outside it make it possible to purify the space from the impurity of the land of the nation. This insight illuminates the halacha according to which the path leading to the Babylonia to the land of Israel when which the Babylonian returnees arrived are pure. The roads of returnees from Babylonia, even though that they were within the, the lands of the nations, are pure in status, even though that you didn't Clean. The reason given follow a Tanaitic Midrash on the verse in Deuteronomy and settle in their towns and homes. And the Midrash is under the presumption that we have learned that the legs of the land of Israel purified the land of the nations. The legs, the legs purified, the continuous, the walking. Thus, the, purif thus the purification of these roads is accomplished on the base of Jewish presence. The beauty of the land of the nations is the outcome of the continuous gender presence. Pure purification, in, purific, purification is affected not only by settlement or purchase, but also through continuous Jewish presence, even as far as Babylonia. And I don't know what about uh, much places which much more far. The common, the common trend in al that are occupied with the purification for the impurity of the land of the nations is the creation of territorial, 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 territorial continuity from the domain of the returnees from Babylonia until Syria, which is, which is for the most part included in the domain of the Egyptian immigrants or in the borders of the promised land that extend to the Euphrates. This continuity purifies the area Purifies the areas that extend the land of Israel and are appended to it, and requires the addition of commandments that are depends on the, that are dependent on the land of Israel, such as sabbatical year and this settlement, presents and purchase of space between the northern and the north and between the northern and the north northeastern line of the borders of the region of Babylonia, which begins in Acre and extends to the and extends. Uh, to the northeast, to the, to the borders of the biblical prom promised land, which are far, far further north, will lead to the entire domain being, being considered the biblical land of Israel, free of the decree of impurity of the land of the nations. The Tanaitic sources then make it clear that the decree of the impurity of the land of the nation function as a tool in the hand of the sages, we use it to define and expand the domain of Jewish settlement. Uh, and now to the Lecha as demographic tool, well, to build and seize ex exemptions. The deployment of Lecha pu purity and impurity to define demographic spread can be seen elsewhere in rabbinic literature as well. The particularly in particular, in Rabbi Yudah Nasi's exemption from commandments that are, depend, that are dependent on the land. Rabbinic literature contains many rep reports about places that Rabbi Yudah Nasi exempted from the commandments that are dependent on the land. In the Jerusalem Talmud, 
the cities of Beit She'an, Kisaria, Beit Guvrin, and Kfar Tzemach are listed. In Tosefta Ailot and in Jerusalem Talmud, the story of Ashkelon's exemption appears. In the Mishnah Ailot, the exemption of, of place called Keni, which some suggest as Kisaria, some with Eilat even, is reported. The locations that Rabbi Yudah Nasi exempted from the commandments of the sabbatical year, Hittith and, priest, and priestly dues, were also free of the impurity of the land of the nation. The area's unique status, exempt from the priestly dues and tithes, is true of the enclaved cities. Cities surrounded by a land of cities surrounded by the land of Israel, for example, Susita, and the village around it, and Ashkelon, and the villages around it, even though that they are free of tithes and the rule of sabbatical year, are not subject to the law governing the land of the nations. And the exemption for commandments that are dependent on the east of the, of the land does not bring with it the decree of the impurity of the lands of the Gentiles from these places. The common denominator for most of the places whose exemptions are, attribu at, are attributed to Rebutan Asi, Bet She'an, Kisaria, Bet Guvrin, and Ashkelon, is there being mixed cities where Jews and Gentiles live together. Thus, Rebutan Asi goal, we can conjecture was to make it easier for Jews to live in those places. Aaron Oppenheimer tied the, the process of urbanization that the land underwent during the Severian period to Rebuilding Sea exemption, meant to encourage Jews to settle in cities. The unique status of the place that Rebuilding Sea exempted is an outgrowth of the intermediate state of those settlements. There was no place to decree the impurity of the land of the Gentiles which would distance Jews from those settlements. This approach in rabbinic literature, which encouraged Jews to settle in a given space through its purification for the impurity of the nations, arise in the Jerusalem Talmud and in parallel in Genesis Rabbah in the discussion of space of Ashkelon South, the district, district, district of Gwar, which is uh, free of the impurity of the land of the nations. Why did they make no decree about the, the, about the, the direction of Kral? Kral, it's in the, in the southeast, southwest corner of the land. Okay. How far? Rabbi Hanin, in the name of Rabbi Shmuel ben Chagai, Rabbi Hanin, the name of Rabbi Shmuel ben Rabbi, Rabbi Yitzhak, up to the book of Egypt. But is not the oasis of Gaza a good one? Pishpesha, it's a weird name. Said before Abiyusa, I asked Rabbi Acha and he permitted. So I go to the conclusion. Uh, in this lecture, I attempt to present the I attempt to present the halachic conception of the impurity of the land of the nation as a tool employed to shape the borders of the land of Israel and even encourage uninterrupted Jewish settlement. The decree of the impurity of the land of the nations, we have noted, most likely stamped from the desire to segregate, segregate the Jewish population from the, from the non-Jewish that surrounded them. Nonetheless, rabbinic literature used the same decree to shed the borders of the land, encouraging settlement outside the borders of the audience from Babylonia by making it possibly to purify such land through continuous settlements or presence. Moreover, the decree of Rabbi Yudan Asi made mixed cities within the borders pure in order to encourage Jewish settlement with the Gentiles during the, the, the period of growing urbanization. The, cha the changing Jewish law as relates to rabbinic literature demonstrates the dynamic nature of the land's borders. The impurity of the land of the nation was in effect a, a, a central tool employed, employed by the rabbis to shape the territorial space considered to be the land of Israel, both conceptually and practically. Uh, thank you. It's really fascinating uh, material. Um, I have one question of clarification and then a general question. The question of clarification is, so um, am I right in thinking that there are sort of, uh, there's this kind of epistemological rupture between a period where you have these ancient sages who have uh, somewhat uh, mystical or obscure, or hard to interpret 
statements, and then the, in the rabbinic, rabbinic period, these are interpreted. That, and the, 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 there's, there's a distance, an epistemological difference, oh, distance oh, oh, between two layers of. Do you, of the rabbinic, do you mean the rabbinic literature or the, the, the gap between Israel and Himya and the rabbinic literature? Yes, exactly. So there's a Tanaitic. Uh, no, let, let's make it order. There is Israel and Himya, which are biblical books. It's from yeah. the, the mid of the first millennium BC. Yeah, yeah. Then so that's after the, this, the original statements come from this period. Or not. Of the rabbinic literature? The original statements about the impurity of the land of the nations come from that period, and yeah. there's a later person oh. of interpretation. Or is there like a continuous epistemological? Okay, it's 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 complicated. It, it, no, <laughs> it's complicated, but our literature, our rabbinic literature, yeah, was edited at the beginning of the third century CE, yeah, yeah. the first stage, yeah. and the second stage from the fifth century. Yeah. See, yeah, but they relate the the, the 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 solution about the decree of the of the impurity of gentle land to rabbi who were lived at the second century BCE. Yeah, but we we have only their statement that the decree yes. is for the for yeah. the second century BCE. Yeah. We, we can't be sure in that. Sure. Okay, but and if we, we have, if we if we believe that they the, these sages did say this, then these have made these statements, then we have a layer where somebody said this, and now yeah. hundreds of years later, we are trying to figure out what they yeah. meant by that. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but my aim was to find what could the rabbis of the third century, yeah, yeah. What, that, that do they, what do they mean? Yeah, what yeah. did they want? What, do, what was their motivation? Yeah, the, the historical question is another question. Yeah, no, I just wanted some general, general context. And, yes. Okay, so my question is... <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, I was very fascinated by this idea of the legs of the Jews purifying the earth. So, and so um, this suggests to me that rather, I feel in Islamic law, everything is pure and less impurified, more or less. Or you have certain impurifying substances that that achieve. Whereas this suggests that sort of nature is impure, or perhaps society is impure, until it's purified. It's like guilty until proven innocent. Mm -hmm. It's a good point. But because in Islamic law, you have statements like the sun purifies. So the sun shines down and then everything is, the sun is, or the rain, or so the rain is purifying the sun. So nature intrinsically has mechanisms for purifying the world. But so if you have the idea sense? of a homeland, it's, yeah. yeah, which is different, that Judaism is territorial, whereas yeah. Islam is universal. Yeah, but, but the, the, the territory no, comes from. I'm not, I'm yeah. not sure. It's, it's, it's a very good point, yeah. but if we'll take the time before the decree, yeah. what was the status of all over the world? Right. It, was, it was pure. Right. Mean, the meaning is that only the decree made the area outside the land of Israel impure. Yeah. And what happened now? What about all these priests, Jews priests in New York? Yeah. How did we live in impure land? The answer is in the Babylonian Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud, blood, this, this, this. He cancelled it. Yeah. He cancelled it. Mm -hmm. and, and as a matter of fact, he, as a matter of fact, he cancelled it and, and, and returned to the to status that there is no impurity mm -hmm. outside the land of Israel. And that, I think in the Mishnah, we have the land of Israel is holy more than all other countries. The statement is not that the other countries are impure. Precisely. Yeah. Uh, the land that's, that's is holier. As you said, the, the, land, the land of Israel is holier. But you touched what they have done. They made, they made all the area outside of land of Israel unpure yeah. for, for, for their time, for their period. Yeah. Yeah. Because now it's constant, in, in consciousness at least, and in practical. Yeah. That is actually in some ways a follow up to, to Ed's question. Is, aren't you perhaps setting up a, a false dichotomy here on Gadab and Achukit? That, in other words, couldn't it be that Rashi and Rambam are correct in that an original discussion had to do with ritual purity of the dead, but that because in a different historical period or a later one, it came to serve also an additional purpose, the idea of trying to reestablish Jewish settlement, yeah. uh, et cetera. 
that then this extra layer was added. Who am I against <laughs> Russia and Maimonides? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who am I? But, but you can solve that by but, yeah. it. But, <laughs> but, but all they were so but great. This point, <laughs> but but really this point of the legs of the yes. of the of the the of the of the of the of was in front of Russian Rambo. It was before. Yeah. It's before their time and before their eyes. All the sources, and I didn't, I didn't bring them all. Okay. There are plenty of sources that, that the meaning of them, that the continuous make it pure and the legs make it pure. So what I think that may be Russian or Roman meant, about Chris Nays, I have other suggestions. Yeah, a different case. Huh? Yeah, different case, and I think that you understand what yes, I'm trying I to do. hint. I do. <laughs> But 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 you know, it's it's a good thing. So, it's, 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 yeah, but but what, what I like is that they thought that it's a pattern. It's a pattern of impurity of death. It's not impurity of death, but Christine Hayes took it to be impurity of death of the of, 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 of bonds or death. But the pattern is but, but the, 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 the laws are laws of of death, but the, the purifying of them is in a, a different way. An analogy. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Jenny. Yeah. So thank you. This is fascinating material that was very new to me. Um, I was wondering a little bit about the sort of almost social history side. Um, you know, legislators, teachers can articulate whatever kinds of normative structure they want, but having that carried out is another thing entirely. So I was wondering about what the sort of and you ended with this, the sort of conceptual and practical sketching. What do we actually know about how do you physically understand or live a boundary? How do you mark that? I mean, is it just, you know, if, if you're trying to extend territorial, you still need to un recognize that on a social level. And yeah. I was wondering about that side more from the, the sort of, so again, social history rather than the, the normative framing. I was concentrated here yeah. in the long period, but yeah. we have legend, legendary, fascinating legendary material about Robi Abba, that when he went to Acker, he was crying because he left the land of Israel and when he came back, he kissed the, 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 the borders, the stones on, 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 on the shore of Acre. We have, we have a law about someone that his mother was in Babylonia. He asked the rabbi if he can go and be with her. The rabbi told him no in the land of Israel sources. This law is only in the Nanoism, so, so because of this, right. head, the, Babylonian, the, 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 the power in the Babylonian Talmud, blood, cancer. Yeah. But we have, we have descriptions of this, this way of life and thinking. Uh, I'm also interested in the uh, social historical reality uh, behind, behind this text. And, uh, uh, what you presented us, uh, I mean, uh, uh, it was very really appealing. I mean, the the the, uh, uh, the idea that it was about the continu uh, uh, continuity of the uh, of the settlement, but uh, uh, it's hard to believe for me uh, 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 that we had this, you know, the, the headquarters uh, 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 of the of the rabbis who uh, who thought. Uh, and let's push the colonization act uh, 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 mission north now. So, so I think that it may have been the other way around. Uh, so you you have uh, people buying land uh, in the uh, in the north, and rather than pushing the rabbis to do something uh, about it to make their life easier, what do you think about it? Thank you. It's it's it's, an, it's, a, it's another good point, mm -hmm. and. As a historian of this period, mm -hmm. it's hard to say how much the rabbis reflects mm -hmm. all the society. Mm -hmm. We can't be sure that the rabbis are not government of the, of the Jewish society in the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. the, the question is, are they, are they total leaders of this society? We are not sure in that at all. Mm -hmm. Because all yes. the sources that we have are sources of the rabbis, which were intellectually yeah. lit. So it's a source of lit. Yeah. This was their motivation, yeah. and it's connected to what did you ask? The, 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 if you ask if it so, happened, I really don't yeah. know. So whether people care at all? I, I, mean, can, I really don't know because we don't have any sources mm -hmm. of the others. Yeah. We have yes. only those, but it doesn't mean that maybe they were, maybe everyone was under them. It might be, but and, and maybe the minority was under them. 
it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a very live debate mm -hmm. the, and it may uh, be that they literally went into bought estates that weren't contiguous so they wouldn't have yeah. to pay tithes then. yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I'm sure there were those <laughs> very very stimulating thank you so uh, is there a relationship uh textual chronological even just conceptual between discussions of space that you've presented and uh for example distinctions between idolaters and and, and Jews uh concerns about uh metrolinearity and whether the children inherited the status of their parents um, and just one observation, maybe of interest to you, I don't know. Uh, in the 16th, 17th century, uh, rabbis who cater to um, uh, converts who are trying to uh, rejoin the Jewish fold uh, create categories um, that are somewhat reminiscent of these the, the lands of idolatry versus the lands of freedom. It occurs to me that the lands of freedom are. Uh, a little bit uh, close to uh, what you uh, you characterize as the definition of serial, sort of an in-between realm. Um, I don't know the Shalot and Shubot regarding, but it might be interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel alone, he tied between the the impurity of idolatry and the impurity of gentle land. He, oh. he, 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 he wrote something very close to what you said. Daniel yeah. alone, yeah. Daniel yeah, I think you need a clarification of what are the practical implications of living in the poor land of Israel, and because Robert was implying that life is easier. If I understand correctly, it's the contrary. Okay. If you live in you, you have you are exempt of obligations, which are among other, mainly financial obligations. If you do not live within the borders of the land, so just in this, I can. So, so yeah. So um. I think it's a, it's important to clarify it's, that, and if if it makes, okay. if it makes sense uh -huh. to uh, make an analogy between ritual impurity and like this that uh, restricts you from performing a religious obligation, and this impurity of the land of of the land, right? Because if you live in the impure land, you cannot fulfill a religious obligation, which you can fulfill in the land of Israel. So it's it's again it's and if I can ask a short question, a, also another short question um, about the idea of the, the ark making the land the one of these, making the, the land. Do we have in the town of that a little bit? Like this, this sacred object makes the land. Sacred? No, no, no. 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 I, I'm saying, I'm taking you somewhere else. Uh, to, to, the first, to the first point. Yeah. Uh, they didn't see the, the, the Jewish law as a tax or as a punishment. <laughs> the punishment is if you're in status that you can <laughs> that you can obey the law. And as I said, also the legendary statements that people that went out the borders of the land, of the borders of this land, mm -hmm. cried and were, uh, were unhappy with the idea that they are going out the accident. The idea of this, it's not an ark, it's a kind of a closed box. If you enter the land of nations in a closed box, there is no touching between you and the land, and you are not becoming impure. No, we are sure. Ah, you're sure. I want to believe. Okay, yeah. The, the idea is that they, they built an altar, they built an altar in the eastern side of of the of of the Jordan, and the uh, and and what Joshua told uh, 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 said to them, if you think that your land is impure and you will purify it by building a temple or an altar, then you mistake. This is the idea, and we didn't we didn't have time to speak about the east bank of the Jordan. East bank of the Jordan is another intermediate intermediate status like Syria. It's between Syria and the land of Israel. It's uh, because it's part of the land, according to 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 the, to the book of Numbers and the book of Joshua. But it became part of the land only because the sons of God and Reuben asked for Moses that they want to be part of the land. Mm -hmm. So, as a result of this chapter, this book now about it, it's written in the Mishnah that the east bank of the Jordan 
is not enough purified to build the temple. Right? It's part of the land of Israel, but you can't build the uh, uh, tabernacle like, like you built in Shiloh or in Gilgal, only at the west side, at the west bank of the Jordan. Please join me in uh, thanking Our next speaker is Edward Schoolman. Ned Schoolman is a, an associate professor at, um, of history at the University of Nevada, Reno, um, and a current individual fellow at the um, Israel Institute for Advanced Studies, which is where we are today. Um, although his past publications have included studies of religion and identity in late antique and early medieval Italy, his current research is built on crafting narratives of landscape, la sorry, um, crafting narratives of landscape change and exploitation by pairing written sources with paleo-environmental records. Thank you for this word. Uh, today, he will talk about environmental perspectives on pollution in late antique and early medieval Mediterranean, um, an informal and multi-scalar survey. Uh, thank you. And I apologize for the title, and I'll apologize again. Can I just hide this? Oh, I'm already giving away the... Um, hide. What is meeting controls? Yes. Okay. So, um, thanks for the introduction. Before I begin, I'm... Very grateful for the invitation from for, for Yaniv to join you in this conference. Um, but I'm also, we've already said how grateful we are to be here, but I'm especially grateful mm -hmm. and want to offer my sincere thanks. Uh, it's like, I'm sorry, to the Institute, uh, its current fellows and staff who have made my year here exceptional in really so many wonderful ways. Um, and now I'm going to apologize to you. And I want to ask you, the audience here, for your forgiveness. For a presentation that begins with a clunky and vague title, Environmental Perspectives on Pollution in the Late Antique Mediterranean and, and, and Late Antique and Early Medieval Mediterranean, an informal and multi-scalar survey. <laughs> nope. It's going to work. You're paying for your sins. I'm paying for all, so many sins. <laughs> all sins. Anyway, with for your sins, um, a more accurate title with better alliteration would be From the Bathhouse to the Bottom of the Lake. Leprosy to lead, it's the little things that kill you in late antiquity. And maybe then to add a joke about the dangers of including everything and the kitchen sink. But there are limits to my ambition, or oh, maybe not. And also as a final caveat, I have not limited the chronological or geographic scope of this talk. I will include material from antiquity to the Middle Ages and perhaps to the present day, and evidence from Greenland to the Jordan River Valley. And I deleted uh, references to the Song Dynasty in China, although, if we want, um, why not? <laughs> so without uh, further ado, although unknown to those living in the world of late antiquity, their surroundings were full of environmental hazards. Bathhouses, although thought to be the sources of healing and wellness, were instead loci, biohazards of many varieties, including pathogens that cause diseases such as cholera, dysentery, gastroenteritis, infectious hepatitis, Lepo <laughs> leptospirosis and typhoid. Although attitudes on bathing in these communal spaces were mixed, especially in the conflicting attitudes of late antique Christian writers, evidence such as an inscription from Androna, a small town uh, southeast of Antioch that served as one of the uh, Syrian military frontier outposts during the sixth century, demonstrate that baths had also remained spaces connected to notions of healing and wellness. Inscription course says, what is the name of this bath? It is hell. Passing through this doorway, Christ has opened for us the bath of healing. Now, of course, this is just one attitude. Um, we all remember John Chrysostom, who remarks that baths are really inappropriate for those in rural settings. They make uh, men weak and feminine, and that's not what you really know. <laughs> of course, it's coming a century and a half earlier. Um, this is one example of the world. The other example, um, is the abundant and pliable metal lead, so sort of the dangers, which we know, uh, which we now know for its extremely toxic impacts on our nervous systems. And this was everywhere in the late antique world, from pipes, and here I'm giving you an example of a fistula um, from Theodoric and Venna, so that this is sort of the continuity, um, to place settings, to magical scroll, to cups, from which the salts that leach uh, from their surfaces 
uh, into drinks made them wonderful and sweet. Even asbestos was likely used uh, first in an industrial, almost an industrial scale, in early Byzantine wall frescoes, kind of used to help for plaster. So don't eat the eyes out of saints on from wall plaster. It's gonna it's gonna be deadly. So and we know this uh, actually in human bodies as well. And evidence from bones excavated from Roman era London and from the sediment in the harbor of Ostia and from marshes of Belgium demonstrate how dispersed lead exposure was especially, but of course, not only in urban populations. Um, and what I don't want to suggest, though, is that lead is any sort of downfall. It's an indicator of different kinds of activities on the industrial scale, and also what people are using and sort of these quotidian objects. But like with unseen dangers of bathing, those microbial and not necessarily moral, the risks of lead were not entirely unrecognized. A number of authors describe the dangerous effects of cherus, a lead carbonate known as white lead um, that was often used in cosmetics and ointment. Cherus's danger was noted especially if ingested, as such as in the work of Pliny the Elder, who incorporated a few warnings about the substance after a long list of remedies for illnesses uh, that lead could provide. And this is a really, if you want it, uh, book, it's uh, 34, book, uh, book 34, chapter 50, uh, of Pliny's um, on nature, and it's a really wonderful list. He has about 44 remedies uh, that lead can provide. So we've got headaches, hemorrhoids, uh, ulcers, really the whole works. And they said, just don't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> so who knows? Um, but even more casual contact with the metal was known to be uh, was known to cause injury. In his section on De Architectura, uh, Vitruvius uh, clearly issues his opinion on threat. He says, water conducted through earthen pipes is more wholesome than that through lead. Indeed, that conveyed in lead must be injurious, for it is from white lead, or is attained from white lead, and this is said to be injurious to the human system. Hence, if what is generated from it is pernicious, here can be no doubt that it cannot be healthy. This may be identified by observing the workers of lead, who are of a pallid color, mm. for in casting lead, the fumes from it fixing on the different members and daily burning of them destroy the vigor of the blood. Water should on no account be sent through lead pipes if we wish it to be safe. The thing goes on to say all the wonderful ways that lead pipes help move water. Um, beyond these dangers, both recognized and visible, the late Roman world would also produce large scale pollution in its smelting activities that impacted not just local environments, but had a continental effect, even though the scales must be considered and acknowledged. Uh, and I would love to explain this in a lot of detail, depending on how much time I continue to talk. Um, for example, although here there is significant uh, evidence of lead smelting through late antiquity in the early Middle Ages, if you look, well, here I can do a thing. Oh, let's use the pen. So even though if we look here, there's there actually is a lot of lead smelting, like it comes back up. Um, it's often more ignored. More attention has been paid to the evidence of larger scale production that appears in places such as the glaciers of the Alps and even Greenland, which is here, which suggests that the second century CE marked the cessation or at least a significant decline of these activities. Um, in a recent study by Joe McConnell, the periodization of non background lead in Greenland and Greenland glaciers was mapped, I'll put that in quotes, against political and economic changes in the Roman Empire writ large with my own quotations around, of course, Mac and the Roman Empire. And of course, finding the kind of correlation between the archives of the natural world and past societal destructions that gets papers published in PNAS. <laughs> like, this is what we really need. Um, and I'll come back at the end to the fact that although there is a certain decline in non-background uh, lead pollution, it doesn't reach, never reaches zero. And in fact, late antiquity shows a lovely, lovely little increase in decline, and then a quite nice increase through the early Middle Ages. So there, the, the story of lead mapping perfectly onto the Roman Empire is, is um, hooey. Before I move on uh, to more closely discuss the disease of leprosy and lead, here to be understood as biological and toxic metal pollution, it is worth pointing out that the evidence from the Greenland is actually mostly devoid of geography. We cannot tell where the lead comes from, except, except it's European. Um, and the art, there is some argument that with um, isotope percentages that the mines, many of the mines in the Roman period may be from Iberia. Um, this article also ignores, as I mentioned, that there's actually quite a bit of activity after, uh, after the fall of Rome and late antiquity. Um, and I also, um, I won't take any more time to discuss this, but ask me questions. Here. 
Um, so while in a pre-modern environmental context, it may be difficult to define purity environmentally, the notion of pollution, on the other hand, is noticeable in different ways and across different scales. With the rest of this presentation, I will offer two small vignettes on, on our contemporary notions of pollution that we might impart onto the late antique and early medieval world and their measurable environmental and cultural effects. And again, I avoid purity, which is a really hard concept to articulate in a natural world. Um, it's, uh, it's easier to find and identify pollution because we're get, we get to describe it. I mean, what is a pure world when we know there's enormous amount of background lead in, in the environment that just exists? And we'll also see this in the Tiber. First, at a broad scale, the environmental pollution associated with the economies of empire in the form of metal production, especially smelting of lead, and its physiological impacts. Secondly, on the safety of bathhouse water and the issues related to disease, specifically leprosy and bathing, which is a local and small scale practice. While both of these were widespread during the late Roman Empire, economic, cultural, and political changes affected their prevalence, making their absence a remediation, quote unquote, of pollution rather than the success of purity. So I would like to begin with a miracle recorded in the life of Simeon the Younger whose column rested just west of the city of Antioch on a hill overlooking the, over, uh, overlooking the lower Orontes Valley. There is an official named Theodore with the title of Scriniarius, who became afflicted with leprosy and sought out Simeon for a cure. After reaching the top of a mountain outside of Antioch, where Simeon resided and finding the saint, the one selected by God, that is Simeon, raised up his valuable and wonder-working rod and set his seal upon Theodore and said to him, Go to bathe in the bath in the district of Tiberius, which is situated next to the river on the road going to the miraculous mountain. It's very nice, a very specific bath. We know where this one is, but we don't. Um, and in this bath, you will be set free from leprosy. The order does as he is instructed, and after he disrobes into the bath, he finds that he is no longer afflicted, evidence of the miraculous power of Simeon. Leprosy, also known as Hansen's disease, is caused by an infection of the mycobacterium leprae or other related bacteria. There are actually, there are a whole bunch of kinds. Although common in antiquity and, and likely evolved in, it likely evolved in human populations in the Mediterranean basin about 40,000 years ago. Um, and although of course very common, it is in fact not highly contagious and now thought to be primarily spread through respiratory pathways rather than direct skin contact. And this is in fact already described in the work of Arateus of Cappadocia in the second century CE. Nevertheless, Close contact with those who carry the bacterium is the primary route of infection, despite some interesting zoonotic connections, especially with red squirrels, an old world species, and armadillos, a new world species, that can serve as reservoirs for the leprosy bacteria. Late antique baths would have offered relief to many of the symptoms of leprosy, such as decreased sensation, nerve damage, and more noticeable skin lesions. It is for this reason that the connection between the sufferers of the disease and bathing were often made, and not just in the miracle stories of Eastern saints. Yet the fear of the spread of leprosy was often employed as a rationale for excluding those with disease from many aspects of public life. The one example I have is John Chrysostom noted that in those afflicted, uh, some of those afflicted were barred from bathhouses and the form by law, although there's no real way to corroborate this, and it's just so kind of a one-off. And although leprosy, of course, was not highly contagious, the fact that close contact and moist air, such as in the context of a bathhouse, could actually provide a space for the transmission of the um, mycobacterium and would have made these provisions of sort of banning uh, commingling in bathhouses make sense from a public health perspective. However, there is one instance of a bath construction constructed or more likely rededicated um, uh, to those who suffered from leprosy, and this is from the sixth century Sicopolis or Bastion. Its discovery, 70 meters outside of the city, supports the hypothesis, this inscription uh, supports the hypothesis that the setting apart of a special bath for the sufferers of leprosy was therefore important, and the position of these baths in Sicopolis must have been well outside the city um, in the direction of some springs to the southeast. And if you've been to the springs on a hot day, they're quite warm. Um, I've discovered it with my children. I hope there were, I don't see, didn't know if there was leprosy. <laughs> um, the dedication of, of this for this bath is very simple. It's in Theodore, the shepherd that is Bishop allots, renewing them, the baths to those sick with a very grievous disease of leprosy in the time of the seventh addiction of the year 622 
and that is dating from the era of the, the Pompeys. The creation of a bath specifically for those with leprosy may have been a way to combat its deadly spread, but baths were also frequently listed as therapeutic for other illnesses or issues. And I've included this because we've heard really interesting things about medical conditions yesterday. Medieval medical texts mention a number of special ointments that could be applied, should be applied in bathhouses, and recommendations that bathhouses help infection of the scalp and against head lice. Frequent washing was also necessary when having scabies. When dark or white spots appear on the skin, one should rub ointments, natron, and alum into the skin during a visit to the bathhouse. The heat of the hot pools was beneficial in cases of hydrophobia and epilepsy, while swimming in the pools of bathhouses could help overcome atrophy. The combination of bathing and drinking medicinal beverages was one of the key elements in the treatment of jaundice. And of course, drinking certain mixtures just after bathing could also help with abortions. So a whole range of things for which baths could be medicinal. But while bathhouses likely re relieve some of the symptoms associated with leprosy, it did not cure the disease. Nor, as we find out in a wonderful anecdote of Theodore, uh, Theodore of Sirius's religious history, could baths cure uh, diarrhea. Um, as in the text, a monk na named Lemaeus was only cured through prayer as bathing apparently did not help. <laughs> so what does that mean for thinking about biohazards in the world uh, in late antique and early medieval, in the late antique and early medieval environment? It was human waste and its management or mismanagement that was the most consistent or dangerous source of pathogens in this place. Although baths, could although baths would recede from most urban and semi-urban landscapes, they did not entirely disappear in either the East or the West. And while it changed, some of the notions associated with late Roman bathing practices carried over, notably that baths could be places to find help, perhaps in a way that baptism could lead to salvation, maybe alluding to future papers. Yet alternatively, they were recognized for what they were. Uh, what is bathing when you think yeah. about it? Oil, sweat, filth, muddy water, everything repugnant. While baths may have been places to relieve the symptoms of a disease or illness, or perhaps come into contact with new pathogens, their physical structures and the decline in urban spaces and the resources to maintain them limited their availability significantly by the end of the sixth century, at least in the post roman world. Uh, to change scale and address toxic lead in the late antique environment, as we shall see, that metal and the pollution caused by its production, as well as its use, was everywhere from glaciers to lakes to bogs to bones. The evidence of mining and metal production in the ancient world is well attested in the ice cores from both Alpine and Greenland glaciers. Let's get this ready in a second. Uh, the McConnell article mentioned before, um, that I mentioned or that I mentioned before, <laughs> linking the changing patterns of lead pollution in glaciers to these human activities and societal change, was not the first to try and make sense of the residual metals and contaminations trapped in Greenland ice. Already in 1994, a French team um, ascertained that not only were lead levels far above what would be considered a natural baseline, but that the changing levels of contamination roughly matched what would then be uh, calculated as the outputs of metal from mining in Europe and the Mediterranean. For those of you interested in other metals, I have many footnotes. Uh, two years later, the same team matched copper found in the Greenland, uh, Greenland ice cores in, to northern hemispheric production, although with a wonderful spike in, in pollution matching a surge in production during the output of the first century of the Song Dynasty from uh, the, late, uh, the late 10th century. So it doesn't match this. It actually has a wonderful spike indicating that this really is a continental, uh, captures a, con a continental view. Beyond the ice of Greenland, the sediments uh, from lakes in Sweden also witnessed the deposition of lead roughly in line with that in Greenland, but at far lower temporal resolution. Because of the wide spatial resolution over an entire hemisphere, the evidence from Greenland ice cores and Nordic lakes cannot offer specifics about where the activities that caused pollution took place. And uh, even the ice cores from the Alps, which demonstrate 100 times more lead than in Greenland, as well as a parallel record of antimony, another toxic metal linked with lead, tin, and other mint smelting, mint smelting, offer only a general sense of the origin of the pollution. Europe. More specific studies on other lakes, peat bogs, and areas of regular sedimentation all reinforce, at least the scale of the continent, a similar story. That after the second century, there was a drastic decline in atmospheric lead pollution through the fifth century, at which point, at which point the levels of pollution began to increase through the Middle Ages. So what did this mean 
for people living in late antiquity, especially when compared to those who lived during the height of the Roman Empire. Evidence from London demonstrates that in Roman Londinium, data from lead in bone and found in bones, where 90 to 90 percent, 95 percent of all lead exposure uh, ends up, indicates that clinically significant lead levels uh, reflected a chronic exposure and was very common. Um, and so what this means is when you in, have lead in your body, your body puts that lead in your bones, 90 to 95 percent of it, and the rest of it goes and affects your nervous system in the worst possible ways. So it's quite it's quite shocking. Um, they also discovered that 70 times greater there are 70 times greater lead levels in Roman era London um, that make it clear that up uh, then in rural pollutions that make it clear that lead pollution was a problem for more than half the population. Um, in London, their exposure was not necessarily related to smelting, and in fact, um, were probably related to uh, pipes, uh, drinking and eating, wearing cosmetics, medicines, and other quotidian objects made from lead. And this is sort of a throwaway, um, but we have to think this is a world, it's not just the, the lead pipes that affect us, it's going to be dishware, it's going to be seals, it's going to be uh, ampullae, and these are all things that we touch and then we put to our faces. And so even small amounts of lead, you know, can be quite hazardous and Again, lead is going to be everywhere. And I'll have another uh, also very boring slide at the end with more fun lead objects. All right. But what remains unexplained in the data from both Greenland and the Col du Don in the French Alps is the rise in lead pollution after the fifth century. Nobody knows. The use of lead seals to legitimize documents and lead flasks to ferry sanctified liquids from pilgrimage sites um, and lead pipes, the fistulae remained in use in a number of urban contexts where the transportation of water was still required. And notably in Rome, where evidence from the harbor suggests high levels of lead in the water through the early Middle Ages, through the eighth century. Yet these do not begin to suggest why indicators of continental lead, lead pollution began to increase. And here, I would like to offer two hypotheses. First, there's some evidence that new efforts at mining and smelting uh, began in locations on the frontiers or beyond the formal borders of the Roman Empire in the 6th century. Some of these would become important medieval mining centers and uh, present a real discontinuity with Roman, pure, Roman period production. For example, sediment from the Pierre Blanche Lagoon beyond Montpellier in southern France not only evidences a rise in lead pollution around the medieval period from 650 onwards, but also a peak in mercury around 1150, with lead likely a, a product of and with the lead, though, probably a product of production further inland. Yeah. Um, another, another place might be in, in Mel, which evidences uh, trace elements um, in the Alpine glaciers. So a very particular uh, isotope of lead uh, that commenced to a new production in the 660s. And I mentioned actually beyond the Roman frontiers is that you have in what is say Germany, a number of centers where lead is being produced by the seventh century, really small. Uh, we know those from uh, Belgian marshes. Okay. Second, there was an early medieval innovation that increased lead's function. And this is particular in the Umayyad world, where the production of glass in Spain from the mid-8th century and the 9th century includes some recycling, but also the development of a new type of glassmaking technology that resorted to the use of lead slag from silver, mine, from silver and lead mining and processing in the region around Cordoba. And this is identified through isotope analysis. So not exactly perfect, but pretty close, actually. Sorry, I'll go back to here. So this is... Um, I should have my pen. This is a very ugly um, uh, lead uh, lead glass jar, the bottom of the lead jar. The jar itself is not ugly. What's left is this photograph. Is. Um, although separate from the lead, from the rise in the production, it is also in this early medieval period that we uh, first have um, a clear, recognizable description of chronic lead poisoning and that of Paul of Aegina, the Greek physician of the seventh century. He described an epidemic characterized by abdominal colic, paralysis without sensory disturbance, epilepsy, and high mortality. While he did not associate these symptoms exactly with lead toxicity, these symptoms all point to lead. So, um, as a conclusion, um, and I should have kept the song material in, <laughs> as a conclusion in reviewing this material, I was struck by the fact that in antiquity and late antiquity and the early Middle Ages, while the pathways that cause various illnesses remained invisible, the connections between toxic and biological hazards and the diseases they could cause were recognized. We, what we see, uh, we see this not just in medical treatises, but across culture, uh, from poetry to hagiography and beyond. Um, and that's what I have now. We'll also talk for another 10 minutes.
Thank you. Hey, Dick. Um, Harry, about that miracle of Simeon the Younger, do you think he's talking about Tiberius Hot Springs? Because one of the sites that were often uh, to which the Transfiguration was attributed was also the Arbel, which is sort of hanging right over the hot spring. Uh, so it's whatever Tiberius. This is a, a um, we don't know. I mean, that the, the fact that he has to, there are, there's another miracle uh, in which these same springs are mentioned, in which someone comes up to the mountain, and this is in the Omni Orontes, and he's told immediately to run down because he's been cured of his, of his crippled legs. Um, and so it, it presumably is, it's a little far. <laughs> Probably a different Tiberius, but it is interesting that that is, we don't. Um, the excavations in Antioch didn't recover, did not, did not recover baths that are, are named, other than we know there's probably an imperial bath that's been partially excavated, um, but we don't actually have the names associated. We, we, there's a wonderful, from Yakko, there's a wonderful mosaic from the sixth century that has a kind of an imaginary itinerary around Antioch, and it may be one of them there, but they're unlabeled. But, it, but it, the fact that it is Tiberius, and there are and clearly connections to miraculous springs and miraculous and lepre curing leprosy is yeah I think that's that's if it's not a real bath and it's really purposeful that that's the name of I mean it's on purpose that it's evoking that number yeah. Angela uh, yes so I had some I thank you very much for your talk it's very interesting and I have a question so you talk about pollution and I I kept thinking are there these baths that were specialized for leprosy, could there be something about the mineral content there that is effective in soothing or treating? Specifically, I was thinking of sulfur. And then you have also baths, um, hot springs in Austria that are known to contain radioactive elements like radium. I don't know how effective that would be or whether it'd be good or bad, but um, uh, actually people there think it's good. <laughs> Um, I'm I'm not sure about that, but uh, sulfur is kind of well known as a as a skin treatment. So I was wondering if you've done any if, if there's been any attempt to reconstruct what the mineral content has been over time in these baths. Isa, those are like a series of fantastic uh, personal fantastic points and excellent question. I don't know, mm -hmm. um, and uh, not I mean my ignorance is is deep and wide. Uh, mm -hmm. And but as a as a sort of as a conjecture, um, even in Pliny, so Pliny the Elder, so writing long before I'm interested, it was really clear that that a lot of these and that sulfur is of course has curative powers. It's sulfurized lead has curative powers. The baths can be important places of healing, um, and sort of like in a in a medicinal Roman sense, not really understanding how that works, but certainly apply things that are antiseptic to wounds. I mean, they're not understanding that connection. Um, but we're not really sure about the bath in Betshian. Uh, we don't know where it is. And we also don't know exactly what's up with that inscription. Um, it's a one-off. Like, it's not discovered. and doesn't really have the context of, of the bath. There are uh, a number of baths in Betshian. There's a really beautiful... Everyone should go. We'll make another field trip. It's really well-preserved. Um, a sixth-century bath, wonderful cholesterol. But that's not the bath for the lepers. This was somewhere outside of the city. Was it a hot spring? Uh, they're warm springs. Okay, so they're 28 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Oh, it's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> we know where you're going. Not not sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's a national park. It's it's totally worth going. Now, is it possible? I, I'm sorry, maybe I, this is my ignorance or my curiosity. Is it possible by doing soil samples to determine deposits of minerals? Of oh, time? absolutely. So that could be something that someone might do with something. Uh, Absolutely, and the where it's been done, um, and where it's actually been done to great effect. Not only so, yes, not only could you figure out what the kind of average content might be, but also based on um, half life of different radioactive isotopes in the native in the water, or in that water, you can tell when it was last used. Mm -hmm. And so the Bath of Androna has been. I mean, they, it was clearly was used into the seventh and probably the early eighth century, which is like sort of a, a place where they have. We would maybe call it continuity over transformation in place that becomes Islamic, but the, but the Christian bath is still being used. So it, it is it is a tool that people use. I, I should say that I came at this. Um, I really had an interest in baths in Antioch uh, from many, many years ago. I should probably all give you the the, the auto history uh, from Antioch from many years ago, and I'm smashing on top of it more in, more recent interest in what we get from sediment cores. 
And so I'm trying to put these together as, as ways to talk about a biohazard and then a, a pollution hazard. So your questions might fall in this the, the huge gap <laughs> between those two things. Chris, thank you. Thank you very much. Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much for the paper. And uh, uh, thank you for, for not buying into the environmental form of road. Yeah. Uh, discourse, which is which which uh, is, is really uh, kind of awkward. Uh, uh, so so I, I want to take a step back and ask a question about your approach. This sort of falls within what is called the consilience approach to, to understanding uh night and deep history. And I absolutely love this. I it's it's got um, you know it's something that Christina Sesa and I have been talking about for a while. She's working on environmental history. I'm working on play, which is the end play. Um, the issue I have, or the problem or the question I have, which I would love to, to hear your thoughts on, is a lot of this remains on a very descriptive level. Mm -hmm. now, now, that's important. In, in historiography, we need that descriptive set. Uh, but we also need, in some way, to bring critical historical, if we can bring critical historical interpreter, I mean, you're referring to Chrysostom, you know, the, the texts are there. We've got these ecosystems of evidence. What do you mean by evidence? But to bring the this consilience approach, which is sort of based on the natural sciences, that was, you know, the PNAS, yeah. to bring it together with a critical historical interpretation and the reading of the texts. Is that somewhere you are here? And, and um, uh, my question is, so what about the lead? I mean, you're not making a, I mean, it's not, I'm, I'm, you're not doing the same argument as your own in the album. Yeah. You know, um, yes. No. And thank you. But so what? I mean, this is really, very, very interesting. But as you said at the beginning, um, uh, you, you can't speak to purity because it's you, you you say it's not measurable. Well, it's 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 still something we can investigate. So it's not measurable according to natural scientific methods, which of course. But is pollution not also the same? Um, is it not equally unmeasurable? Uh, because your approach assumes a modern understanding of pollution, which I understand. It. And I really appreciate this. I mean, please don't see this as criticism at all. It's just, you know, so, my question is so much, you know, um, where can this take us mm -hmm. in terms of better understanding what we are talking about in terms of sanitized parts? Because we do need a consilience approach also in this. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. But thank you. No. I really, this is such hard work and, and I have great appreciate it. I, and I appreciate your, your question. And I, I think when I said an informal and multi-scalar survey, <laughs> I tried to give myself an out. Um, I thank you, thank you for not taking it. You don't have to I, No, no, no. I, I, will, I will happily uh, uh, tackle this. And I, I think you're right in pointing out uh, there's a discontinuity. And I, and, and I could make, as I elaborate this particular project, this particular project, I mean, it's really clear when I talk about a continental wide scale, it's continent. I mean, we could write a continental history of, of anywhere and devoid of people. I mean, I did not, I, it is, when I talk about lead, there weren't, there weren't people. And we could talk about, about leprosy and talk about people because people get leprosy. People don't get lead. It's bodies. It's right? bodies, bodies, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, so there's, there's a, a real scale issue. And so the, so the idea of consilience, which is this notion that by taking the natural sciences and, and, history we can come to some sort of unified unified answer is is it's impossible if if we don't if we just if we don't acknowledge that there are these scale differences like a, if you take a we, we do this we do this history historians all the time yeah. like a letter collection and a chronicle like can i mean they intersect at many places but they're not the same thing 
Um, and we don't have to treat them the same way. And we have people who just study letter collections. I was going to say canon law, but I didn't know the science. <laughs> 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 like, no, well, I mean, but but so so there we we know there are different approaches. I have I have, some of my best friends are people who study canon law. <laughs> <laughs> so so there, but there are these ways we can intersect. And I think for consilience to work, um, and I I gave the this paper as an example. I actually don't think it works. I, I love what they've discovered, but they say continental scale, societal collapse, Rome falls. Well, great, that's that'll get you in PNAS. And they're limited by the number of inches they can they can produce. I have worked with a, a, at a different paper, a different universe. I work with a lot of colleagues in geography who are paleo who are paleo environmentalists or paleoecologists or paleoclimatologists. And there our question is how can we bring to scale to the same things to scale? And so I would never look at a Greenland, Greenland ice core and say it's, we can we can bring anything close to that from a historical record. Mm -hmm. But if I'm looking at the harbors of Rome, for example, of a sediment there, and there's wonderful studies of, of lead from that, you can actually maybe say something. You can say something about, well, we know where the water comes from. We can test it, actually, in the upper Tiber or in the Neri or in the, at the Luno. And we can test it at, and we can test it where it comes out. We can test it in the settlement. And we can get data that is close, not annual, but maybe decadal or within 20 years per sedimentary layer and maybe begin to say something. But it ha but the scale of space and time has to be comparable with what we get in historical archives. And at the moment, it's not. So I think your criticism of, of a consilience approach is fine. I believe that there's a future in which consilience makes sense. I will also say that I am cynical and I know that's where the money is. And I'm willing to follow the money, but I, I I really do believe that that we can we can begin to have a dialogue. But the scale has it has to begin with an acknowledgement of either different scales or working to build things on the same scale. If that makes sense. There's a joke with Nevada following the money, but just oh, come on. <laughs> I mean, yes, I mean, why not funny following the money? I mean, it's it's in fact quite a. I would love if the NSF funded projects in the humanities the way that they fund anything you just say climate and environment and they're like have money and then so so it's i mean it's i'm not i'm trying to hide my cynicism but i'm also you know it's i also believe i'm also maybe a true believer because there's a sub there's sort of topics in consilience yeah where historical research is sort of uh, uh secondary sure Oh, and, and oh. I have a serious problem with that. Oh. I think I, you know because because again it's it's about as you say scale and the quantifiability yeah. and 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 sources yeah. and um, yes exactly as you rightly point out a lot of these consilience histories are totally devoid of bodies. It's devoid of people. It's devoid of you know uh, I'm a socialist. It's not obvious now. So and I'm not saying that approach is good. We have se serious issues here as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, we need to bring these worlds closer together. Um, and, 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 and I, yeah, I, think, I think on the one hand, thank you for, for doing this sort of work. You know, um, well, I, I mean, I actually tag up on this because um, but there's also, you know, he, they also say it's the play. So if you want, you know, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but actually the, the wonderful thing here, and this is the lie that people in the sciences will tell you, is that is that well this is this is the data it's like no 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 you've already decided the yes. scale the numbers Absolutely. what what constitutes background that i read the i read the 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 extra stuff with the download pages upon pages of pdfs to try to make sense of this they are already making many choices and in interpretation that's that's my yeah. problem yes yeah. that's exactly there are there are scientific presuppositions yeah. that are highly problematic yep um, and we need to work through those. It's fun to work through. And, then, and acknowledge them the same way that I can interpret a, a, a story from a bath from the life of Simeon the Younger. Yeah. I can acknowledge it. Like my, I actually don't know where the bath is. And it could, and it, and I could put a footnote and say, well, there are lots of springs. Tiberius is a really interesting place that has springs. And I could make that, make those connections in the same way I have a colleague who could interpret, well, we need to use a different kind of primary component analysis when we do a different, when we, when we regraph this. And, and those are actually discussions to have, and those are things that can go into papers. They can't go into PNAS. They can't go into science. They can't go into nature. So I think there needs to be, it's not, consilience's problem isn't, I mean, there's lots of problems, but it also is a, where do we put the venue where historians 
and paleoclimatologists and paleo environmental historical and paleoecologists can have that conversation on a page. Okay. Uh, I'm very much interested in the, you know, the, 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 the awareness of the dangers yeah. uh, uh, that you were uh, discussing, and uh, you, you, uh, uh, you addressed this issue at the uh, identity of, uh, of your paper. And well, focusing on the, on the bug, uh, so yes, they, they are ambiguous. So, so well, healing places and dangerous places. And, and you, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, the danger of ecclimization yeah. and leprosy. There is one more uh, in the, the demonic places or magical places. And I, uh, so I, 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 I wonder uh, uh, I mean, uh, how much people cared about, you know, uh, leprosy or, or, uh, or maybe, well, the, the, they thought, well, leprosy, who cares about leprosy? Demons, this is the real, yeah. the, the, uh, real danger. Or maybe there is a link between the, yeah. between the two. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was an excellent observation. I, yeah, no. Um, I mean, I the what I, I guess it, it depends on who you're when when and yes. who we're talking yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whether or not someone say, of course, you know, leprosy is transmissible because I've seen people who are in contact with lepers eventually get leprosy. But I, I think actually your point about baths being magical and demonic is, mm -hmm. I mean. It's, it's the same thing with springs, right? These are like, mm -hmm. and you know, a bath, the original baths are, are springs that have been sort of where man has tried to control nature, which I, which seems alien and is perhaps maybe impure. I don't know if people can have a talk about sort of an Aristotelian sense of, of a natural earth. Um, and actually you've given me a wonderful uh, segue when I rewrite this is to use like the, the lamellae, the lead tablets that end up in, in baths because you use, you can throw your little yes. lead tablets into them. Yes. So I think this is a, yeah. A wonderful intersection, but I, it is another thing. And it, I mean, there are demonic, demonic plagues that could be that are just illnesses. Mm -hmm. And so, in a sense, that if you have seizures, right, that could be that could be lead poisoning. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be uh, demonic possession. Although mm -hmm. maybe I, per, I prefer demonic possession. <laughs> I don't know. But there are certain saints that do their miracles, kind of particularly at that. Like mm -hmm. Artemis. Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's, but I was just thinking of later ones, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So you can like something out of that. Yeah. Um, so thanks, Ned. Um, this may just be out of my vein. I hope to find like some some hope somewhere. But could you talk particularly about your hypotheses for change from a more from the resilience side, from than rather simply from the like hazard toxin pollution, we're all gonna die <laughs> side. No, but I mean, so something that I found sometimes interesting in some of the consilience literature when it when it when it works and you know sort of picking up on some of Chris's critiques there um is is the interest in in that resilience side and in the hu the human response and the putting it back into people and the agency and you know could it just be interesting hearing you talk about some of that aspect that other side of the coin yeah no I I, I mean it certainly exists and I mean it's all in some ways it's about I mean I'm being slightly cynical here but it, it's a better story. I mean, it's a more interesting story to talk about, you know, the, the fact that, well, the land is abandoned, no one's there, but it's clear that we can we can put people there and we have ticks that put people there. And we have, we now have, so, you know, paleo environmental evidence that suggests people are, not everyone's dying. And it's not such a, uh, you know, the, the crash, the crashes and the, and the crises and the conquests don't have the same kind of, I mean, they might have an effect, but they also don't have an effect. And that's also a question of scale. Um, I, I've become a real big believer that, um, I mean, maybe not in micro histories, but like in the sense that the scale really does matter, and this and resilience is is scary, right? You have local communities, but what makes a local community and their ability, their ability to withstand uh, pressures and stresses? Um, I'm not exactly answering your question. I think the way you want me to, but I'm I'm thinking I have to I have to process and formulate. Um, but I'll be happy to I, articulate things. In like 10 minutes after a talk. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Last question from Al. Thank you. I, I have many questions about Act One, mm -hmm. and which is a very interesting discussion on possibilities and problems of using these approaches. Could you apply it to this? So I, I understand that you cannot sort of do the fall of the Roman Empire and yes. let it smell kind of this, but does it, is there any correlation that we've seen with? 
and or is it completely meaningless? And, and <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, well, I can, uh, let me. Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you exactly what it is. It is a record of non-base level lead contaminants. Contaminants. Long non-base. So, so that exist in an atmosphere that end up in Greenland over time. That's what it is. Everything else is someone else's interpretation on top of that. Uh, the periodization, the dating is interpretive. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm giving a paper tomorrow in which I in which I say in a footnote, not out loud, that everything is within a century. <laughs> so I'm talking about Rome in the 10th century, but I could also be talking about Rome in the 11th century or Rome in the 9th century, which I think is <laughs> pretty, pretty they matter. They might not matter, they, but they do matter. Hundred years. Yeah. <laughs> well in geological time, it's a it's a it's a blink of an eye. I mean I mean, so the, if we want, if we trust the scientists and we trust their dating, then we can say, of course, well, naturally you look at the, the bullion content, which is silver and not lead, and there are different mines and there are different ways of smelting, and then there are different, like that is a byproduct, but can also be something you, you seek out. Um, but if you looked at this and said, well, just talking about smelting production, things that put a lot of lead in the atmosphere, the story that lead maps onto Rome's rise and fall doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. First of all, you stop too early. Um, you stop after the early Middle Ages. You stop why? Because all because after the ninth century, people are making are mining lead constantly, and then everything gets ruined in the twentieth century because we put lead in gasoline, right? So, but but there's there are about twenty stories you could tell with this. But knowing that the scale is continental, so I can't say, oh, of course, the Merovingians love lead <laughs> and then in the 13th century lead tokens and you, you, we, we can't say that i mean we can say that i mean i'll tell you where we can say that is if we core down into bogs and lakes where we can tell what is coming from what may be coming from atmospheric levels and what's coming from water like closer water like from the surrounding in, inhabited zones and there like the tiber is a really good example so that that's a place where we can say well we know where this lead is coming from it's coming from upstream and there you begin to tell different stories. And so I think you could take this and merge it with a local data set. And that actually gives you all these things. So of course, where we can see something is maybe atmospheric, but something is certain local, something's coming from um, smelting, and something's coming from the fact that we've got residual lead that comes from water pipes. And so you would be able, you that's why I think it's not just consilience in that you are dealing with multiple fields, but in dealing with multiple scales. Thank you. Thank you. One last comment, just interesting. Um, you mentioned um, glass making as yes. a possible yes. uh, source for this uh, rise in lead. And, and we also had a mention yes. of, of lead earlier as something impure, uh, of glass wow. for something impure. And I thought it was really interesting. I want to ask about it. We really have to finish. So <laughs> the glass was made by soil. And we are speaking about territory, the beauty of territory, it leads us to the soil that was made. Mm, okay, so that's uh, circumstantial. Anyway, we'll have, we'll have to continue this conversation later on. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a copy break, right? We have an extended copy break. Yeah, we have a in 27 days. Yeah, the industrial one, because in, it's an interesting uh, heat district, um, a lot of lead mining, and then they could not touch it, and then they could it's not the organization. Yeah, that's right. It's not sticking up a bar from your new department. In, in Mason yeah. as well, I like, guess. Yeah. 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 In other words, I guess I'm wondering, yeah, it's interesting just to be these field things, is the difference in levels of production can only reflect different usage Absolutely. and consumption and that's not necessarily yeah. going to be about levels of production. I thought I would agree that it's not talking about the energy, but I think in, 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 it's almost 90% of it's probably being used for some sort of project that's again, that's really the infrastructure. And it's it's common, it's viable, it's really transportable. You know, I was going to ask a question. Thank you for your remarks. Uh, I, 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 I
That's what I'm thinking. I'm going to steal it because actually. Uh, there's a wonderful uptick beginning in the 10th century of blood in Rome again. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's my name. 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 It may also have been something maybe was related to like his uh if Charles might sound I mentioned sound like אנחנו <laughs> 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 אז הנה, אני מקצינה ומוציאה את הדיסקונטי שלי, אנחנו מסודרים כאילו? אה, מעולה, זה חילה. זה נקליטו. באתי לסבך. אה, אתם לא קלטתי אותי, מסתכלים. אז הוא קיים שם? This is why I'm the, the point of like a book. Like, yeah, that's right. There's a there's a an also very good article by um uh, Toyota Cosmo is the primary author about the reader that the audience there was like, oh it fell because of climate. And um they went and did the work and then you know it kind of doesn't match up at all. Um but there's but it's worth on the top two articles that people stop paying that it's the climate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. it's like that you know, yes, there are kind of factors and maybe lots of different things, but there's a 50 year difference between a changing pattern in one year and then moving out to the empire. 
and, and Cretans are really good. And so we have a baby that's really concrete. And then 50 years, like, I mean, 50 years ago, like, Nixon was president. Yeah. And I mean, like, have a style of the mind. Right. I, I need a snack. I work for I I come from my company. Thank you for the fight. It's because I have an interest. I have to This is what I'm also supporting. I don't. I'm not. I I I jump in this debate really. Yeah, sure. Tina is uh,
היא לא, היא תגיע ביום שלישי לארוחת ערב, כי אז מתחיל לבוא. אבל My name, which is just the email. I'll send them two separate emails. Yeah. And then they do that. As well as that, it's all part of the idea of keeping it. Not till tomorrow, but imagine getting to some now. See, you're my favorite. Just now, you're going to tell us much so that you can appreciate my good at my bad to do. הייתה ראשונה שעשינו ביחד, הוא עזר לי. אחרי שקיבלתי את המשרד באוניברסיטה הלכה, אמר נטע, שאני אמרתי את עצמנו. אני תמיד יהיה חסון את זה, ולהשתמש בכל התקנות הללו. זה בטח הכל נעשה במחשב עכשיו. הכל במחשב. אז את יודעת עכשיו את המחשב. אני לאט לומדת, אני לא מבינה אבל אני מבינה את החלק של המחלית שמלמדת אותי, ועושה יחד איתי, וזה היה מאוד מצחיק. אבל את האחרון שעשינו היה... רגע לפני שקיבלתי את התקן, ברגע שקיבלתי את התקן, הוא אמר לך, אין לך מיון דו. אבל זה מאוד פשוט לשנינו, באסתטיקה, וגם כשמתגלגלים משהו בעצמך, בין אם הוא עושה בגלל אם אני יותר עם היותה לי בעצמי, כל החיים שלי, כמו שהמזכר של העם, הוא עכשיו עושה הרבה שאולות שהתנגדות בבית הספר של הילדים שלנו כבר כמה שנים, לעשות להם עבודות נגרות. ואחרי זה שאני מבקשת פשוט תובנות אחרות, איך דברים מתחברים, גם אם זה קנה מידה יותר קטן? כן, אתמול הוא ראיתי פרק עולה של בנה. שיעשה את זה ככה? לא. ככה אני אומרת, לא, אבל אין מה להגיד, יש לדברים קצת משל עצמם, בבית הספר צריך פרגולה זה יהיה קודם, אחרי זה צריך לתת לנו פרגולה זה יהיה אחר, וכשהיה את הדקר השני, הצלחנו לשכנע אותו לפנות לנו בבית כזה עם כאן אינגל, זה ממש כבר בכל מיני דברים מידות וזה וזה. זה יפה ששני הילדים לארץ ועוד ילדים. בגלל זה אני כל כך דוחה עכשיו באוניברסיטה שיפתחו באמת תוכנית לסמסטר רביעי לסטודנטים יותר ראשון שיפתחו ואני אנהל את זה. בהצלחה גדולה, זה נשמע לי מאוד טוב. אני עשיתי, לקחתי בדרך שלי את התוכנית הכי מוצלחת שלהם של בנון בוולדים. דתי, כתוני אני יכולה להשיג בזה, שזה הרבה יותר פשוט מלמוד בכלל. סתם ילכו למוזיאונים, הם יקראו איזה חלק מהתנ"ך האומי הרבה חדשה, ואני גם דיברתי עם ראש המסדר, והוא ישקו לי חומר שיבוא, ויהיה איתם, וזה. אם אפשר למשל להביא אותו כשנעשה את הטיול לסטרום, כשהוא יוכל לדבר על הפילולוגיה ועל... ‫הוא אדם מאוד 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 נחמד. 
והוא אמר בטח תביאו את הסטודנטים ואולי להם הם יכולים לחפור קצת אם הם רוצים אני רוצה לפחות, אני אלמד את זה, וזה יכול לפתור לי את כל ההרגשה של להיות תנועה ללא מישהי, אז אם את משנה, אני כבר הייתי תקועה ביניהם. בדיוק. גם יש להם מוסות, ללמד את ההיסטוריה דרך השטח, זה נכון על הסטודנטים, זה נכון. ואני יכולה לקבל את הפנים, קורס אחר שאני אמרתי כמה אנשים במדינות היכולים לפעול, כדי ללמד את למשל על מה החשיבות של ירושלים ואני יכולה להתחיל בעיר שביעית, ואני יכולה כן להגיע לעת החדשה, ו... בדיוק, בדיוק, אבל מכיוון שהייתי באסלאם ולמדתי על זה, אז כמובן הקטע היה חלק מבארי על זה. טוב, אני מקווה שדווקא תצלח, באמת יש פה גם אנשים נורא מעניינים לתפס אותם פעולה, אני רוצה להגיד... ואת, אם את עצמנו, את לא אומרת את הפורס, אנחנו יחסי יהודים נוצרים בימי הלילה, או משהו כזה, אז אני אשמח כי אני אמרתי, איך שאני רוצה לגנור את זה, זה לא רק שייך, אוקיי, אז אני לא מבין את זה, אבל גם כן אני מבין גם אנשי סגנון, אני מבין, אבל אני גם כן אביא אנשים מקומיים ללמד את זה, ואני גם כן, אני בניתי להם את התוכנית למשל בפילות רידרום של ‫להגיע לשם בגן שמאלי, ‫ואז אפשר להגיד שהם יצאו ‫בעלות הצלב ביום שישי ‫ואז יעשו את ה-Easter Vigil ‫בכניסה לקבר, ‫ממש כל ה... אין חוויה כזאת. And it really looks like the Middle East. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they go with the cool ones. They were not scared at all. My mom was like, right. Yeah, that's so nice. You need to instrument in that. No children. This is direct to the Enjoy yourself. Sorry. Enjoy yourself. Yes. Very much. This next one, we heard her. This letter, she wrote her. 
Yes, I know. I know. I, I'm a mess of a I got you to <laughs> that my book was more fast than I thought it was. <laughs> yeah, see, during the year, it's what's so depressing is literally the same time return from my sabbatical last summer. The girl who told you know, the last month of my sabbatical year. Oh, I'm sorry. Going back. Oh, yeah. It's so, you know, it's just really, really assuming teaching the students are so good, you know, it's a little tougher to add in on mini meetings and everything else, like yes. reading grants and things like that. Yes. Yes, yes, I know. Uh, and uh, it's not that I mean, uh, uh, during this about the year, I said that you have you know, stupid things about changing. Uh, you know, I mean, not a job, but the, the, the institution. Uh, because, you know, that, that somehow, um, I mean, all my life, uh, I've been in the city of course, but it's about, you know, the killing where I think the meat. 80s, I entered for the first time to the gate of the university and I thought, well, wow, with the world coming five years, I, I would be here. And I'm still here. Years later. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and, and it's, uh, there are advantages, obviously, but there are plenty of advantages. advantages. So it's like lab, good lab, you know, there's a slow accumulation of verbal uh, and other no, things. If you want to remain I hold it, that's the first thing. I don't Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Because of that, it's like, so But okay, just being polite. I was just going to say, but is there other than crap? No, 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 I mean, obviously, I know no, being in, uh, in the UK, I'm thinking of the UK, yeah. uh, which is we see easier because we know this uh, language, uh, yeah. transcript will do from this point as well. But, but, it's impossible but, but, to break into that system from yeah, the outside. It's, it's more difficult. Yeah. And, and also, I'm, I'm quite like I was it's much more open. There is a higher level of yeah. So you think you're arriving? I mean, I for my career, yeah. Paris was the obvious place to go. But uh, if you are in Paris for an academic purpose, it's still yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the interaction is possible, but the the bottom interaction is on your shoulders. Uh, yes. uh, whereas when I arrived in Oxford for the first time, and I expected to find the Irish and I I think it's the. Uh, I think you have to make this bigger. Understood. Yeah, but I Quite unexpected. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, we were at dinner, I was a week ago, uh, one of the colleges, and she was like, yeah, but it was quite well, but at the beginning of this year, in January, it happened in, in, in December, uh, so in generation, she was, you know, Are we good in terms of future, or how so. did you come to do that? Wait, which computer is the, well, yes, yeah, so it's going to be Oh, 
Yeah. Sorry. Never forgive you. Wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> <laughs> no choice. <laughs> but yes, obviously, I, I keep talking. I keep talking to people. Yeah, yes. <laughs> they're very, very yeah. vague. Yeah. 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 Uh, very old. Yes, obviously. <laughs> yes, but, but well, anyway, so particularly Gary, this is a very, 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 very good thing. Mm -hmm. well, maybe I, yeah. I, I mean, I love them. Oh, they are seat things that they can buy. Yeah, I need one to get shy. So. No, 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 just no, just no, minimize no, it no, rather than closing it, just let it be. Just minimize it. Got it. Very weird. Do you know what else? Three years straight. Sorry, this is the mama. I can't tell what you're saying. No, no, twelve years. 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 I would like to 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 teach once again. Yes, yes. That's I would like to teach once again. Yes, yes. That's I Going so the whole thing that is what is the mechanism by which it becomes active? He made it to the uh, the other guy, but the um, uh, uh, leg. Uh, we will continue the same format. This seems to work very well with a 30 minute speaker followed by 15 minute questions. And our third presenter today is Dr. Wendner, who's an art historian working on religious architecture from the high Middle Ages. Uh, Professor Kodner has published in the Journal of uh, or Jewish Studies Quarterly, Vietor, uh, Zion, and is the co-editor of two volumes on religious architecture. <laughs> She's currently completing a book project on Jewish ritual facts in Germany, a project she began as a postdoctoral fellow in uh, a Sheba Baumgartner's ERC project called Beyond the Elite, Jewish Daily Life in Europe and continued as a Rothschild uh, postdoctoral fellow at uh, Oxford. Since 2020, she holds a position as lecturer at the Open University of Israel, and in October 2022, she was granted funding from the Israeli Science Foundation for a collaborative project on the Mikveh of Cologne with colleagues from Cologne and Barbara. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thank you very much for the kind invitation, uh, Yanni, because uh, very few of you uh, know me. I'm going to say uh, a, sen a few sentences about my wider project and then go into the um, uh, talk for today. So this is a bit of background to my project. Um, I work on the architecture of Jewish ritual baths, which are spaces built for purification ceremonies. My interest is in the buildings, but any investigation of religious architecture, or maybe architecture at large, has to consider the function of the buildings as a factor in the design that one is trying to analyze. So in the case of religious architecture, it's imperative to consider the dual nature of ritual as encompassing a performative aspect 
and an underlying theology that influences both the details of the ceremony um, and the aesthetic requirements from the space or architectural iconography. So what drew me to working on spaces for purification was the architecture of a set of very unique ritual bats. And you're seeing here the pen and section of the bat from um, Fire. And they're not in scale one to each other, just so we have a big enough um, uh, section in order to see it. I'm going to resist the urge to talk too much about the images uh, because uh, then I won't read my lecture, but I'm very, very happy to talk about it in the discussion. Um, so what drew me to working on spaces for purification was the architecture of a set of very unique Jewish ritual baths and the fact that all the buildings had at their, what all that the buildings had at their center was a very deep pool of water for ritual submersion in the nude, above which were underground towers or inverted towers and we can find them later. So uh, a pool for ritual immersion is actually all that the building is uh, built around. The water was supposed to be used for ritual submersion in the nude, another point we'll come back to. The potency of this very sensual, very individual, right? Sensual is in terms of um, uh, using the senses. An individual, because it needs no clerical affiliation and because it has male, female, and gender neutral variations. And this drew my attention very unusual spaces for very unusual ceremony. What I want to present here are some thoughts on the convoluted image of purity and purification that emerged when trying to work out what the buildings were for. Supposedly, this was not supposed to be anything more than a short background task. This is taking, um, I don't want you reading this up too soon, so I'll go back. <laughs> so I'm going to go back because I think I drew my own attention away from what I was saying. What I want to present here are some thoughts on the convoluted image of purity and purification that emerged when trying to work out what the buildings were for. Supposedly, this was not supposed to be anything more than a short background task. Reading scholarship on purity and Judaism in the Middle Ages, it all sounded quite straightforward. But actually, there turned out not to be one big study of the different purification circumstances and immersion circumstances in the Middle Ages, and most work focuses on women's immersion, which is only one of a spectrum of different immersion ceremonies which are relevant to the discussion. So trying to read the full spectrum of sources and ritual immersion from the high Middle Ages, a different background picture emerged for me, for my research, a varied, layered, and multicolored spectrum of immersions with deeply reflective rabbinic passages about what impurity is, where it lies, how it can be countered, why it necessarily returns always, and what use one can get of purification rites, even if no actual purity is ever really possible. This is the background to the talk and the web of purity issues that arise from medieval rabbinic writing in Ashkenaz and Sofa, today's German speaking lands in France. As an aside, I want to say that my talk is about actual purification practices rather than the political projection in hindsight of uncomfortable pasts, which we've been thinking about. But still, the second part of the talk will actually touch upon a micro version of something of that same sentiment on how something that went wrong can be righted through the idea of purification. So rather than discussing purification of various religious others or forging a falsely sanitized, sorry, or purging a falsely sanitized past, as we heard in some talks yesterday, rather, I want to talk about internal purity of the self vis-a-vis -vis one owns one's own impure past that needed sanitizing for a cleaner future. Um, how I'm gonna do that is think about three things. The model here is cyclic, and I wanna look at it through three entry points. One is regarding the idea of a pure community and every individual's responsibility to keep it so. The other is that any community necessarily encountered rupture with how a person, and then asking, Sorry, and how individual, I'm gonna go again. Any community necessarily encountered rupture with individuals and rabbis dealt with the question of how a person can be re-embraced after they jeopardized their own purity. And the third is the idea of cyclic uh, model of purity rather than linear or historical. So I begin. Elisheva Baumgarten has shown that medieval Jewish authors um, distinguish their Jewish communities from the Christian neighbors by emphasizing that Jewish women were careful about the laws of ritual impurity. These laws stem to some extent from the biblical directives in Leviticus about different types of impurity, but were mostly detailed in rabbinic literature, first in the Mishnah, the authoritative late antique interpretation of biblical law, 
and then through expansion, the expanded rulings of the Talmud that interprets the Mishnah, and through late antique and medieval rabbinic treatises on Jewish law, halachic compilations, which also often follow the same order. This last category, high medieval religious legal compilations, are the sources which I use. My preference is for treatises compiled by rabbis who lived in the cities where the ritual baths which I'm studying have been found or that they studied or taught there. The aim of the text is to provide comprehensive, the aim of the text, uh, the, what the sources uh, uh, do, regardless of what I'm doing with them, is to provide comprehensive directions for every aspect of life, large or small, for any Jews, not just the learned elite or a specifically pious group. They therefore need to be read through because purity issues arise throughout and not just where you might expect them. So going back to the introduction on purity in Jewish law, despite continued theoretical discussion, most of the laws of purification found in the Bible and the Mishnah fell out of practice with the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. Indeed, many of the original obligations were intended only for people uh, carrying out rites in and around the temple, and therefore they lost their potency with its destruction. In other cases, purification was simply impossible without temple-based ritual, such as the red paper ceremony necessary for purification from corpse contamination. With no way of reversing defilement or of contact with the corpse, one of the most serious, and to probably use the wrong word, but easy to understand, one of the most contagious impurities because it was passed by touch. Within a short period, everyone became irreversibly impure from a rabb rabbinic point of view, and most purification categories fell fully out of practice. The one category that continued being mandatory according to rabbinic dictates was the purification of women. Rabbinic law, dictates careful purification rites for married women after any bleeding. So menstruation, but also birth, miscarriage, um, stillbirth, or disease that caused a natural issue of blood. This purification entailed full body submersion in water that had not been drawn by human effort, often in a specialized pool constructed for which this ritual purpose, which is what we're seeing. Although purification could also be carried out in natural bodies of water, and I'm happy to return to that as we speak later. The purification was supposed to occur seven days after cessation of bleeding, during which time husband and wife were supposed to be separated. The separation took on many roundabout laws, but maybe table rabbis actually make it clear that the main point was to refrain from sexual contact. Shia J.D. Cohen has discussed sources according to which women were supposed to wear specialized clothes during this time of separation in order to minimize attraction. So at the time of their impurity, they would change their clothing and dress in dirty clothes so as to be repulsive to their husband. Um, we can argue about the uh, translation. I can he uh, bring the Hebrew later. And you can see also um, uh, in the note the different um, other compilations in which something very comparable appears. Here the source mentions explicitly that clothes should make the wife seem unattractive to the husband in order to help them maintain the physical separation and refrain from any sexual contact during her bleeding, but also the seven days immediately following it and until her purification. In manuscript variations, and here from circa 1290 from the Bodleian Library, there's a direction to wear white underclothes after the end of the bleeding and before immersion so that any spotting during the seven clean days would be easily seen. But also, and the text here makes clear, they should, she should be careful about not having an intermediate bathing in between the days of bleeding and the, and the immersion, which has to have seven days of separation prior to it, in order that they won't imagine that the earlier cleansing is one which actually brings to purification and have sexual contact with the husband. So there is actually a worry in this manuscript and in the source we, we saw before and comparable others against women cleaning themselves and changing their unattractive clothes before the period of separation has ended and sexual contact is supposed to resume only following immersion in the ritual baths. Um, like Sefer Aura, which we just saw, this miscellaneous compilation too explains that it's important to remain in unattractive clothes and refrain from washing for the full duration of the week after menstruation and before immersion in order to buffer any sexual contact. Other sources also mention textiles placed around the house or on the bed of the menstruating woman or her chair during this time which could also aid everyone in the household, including prob probably most importantly the husband, but her as well, in remembering her status as Nida, a woman who is separated prior to her ritual purification. After the end of the bleeding, the preparation for immersion begins with the washing of all the textiles, and let's just read this together. So we make sure to be extremely strict with ourselves and to not eat from the same bowl, uh, like the collective we in the, in the source, 
or from the leftovers of her food and do not sit on her seat and receive nothing directly from her hand. And we give her cutlery and a bowl and bed sheets and pillows and blankets to use during these days of separation. So you kind of can imagine the home space of these definite, the, these separate uh, items in order to signify visually that she's separated. And when the time arrives for her to purify herself, she washes in water those clothes which are stained and other items which she sat on, she also washes in water. And it's a positive habit to act that to prevent marital relations during the period of separation. So you can also imagine these um, uh, textiles around uh, uh, the house and their use. The prohibition because of impurity, there is none. And we're gonna to return to this sentence. So it sounds like a potent precursor to washing her own self and immersing, beginning by taking all the textiles from the home and lifting this temporary covering, washing everything. I don't know if we should take it face value, but she's the one who's supposed to do it herself. But if she did, it'd be interesting. Then she washes herself in warm water and then immersing. Following immersion, rabbis prescribe a sexual encounter as soon as possible, which is a very good excuse <laughs> as any to show this awesome image from a 15th century miscellany <laughs> of a husband waiting nude in bed while his wife immerses, also nude, in a ritual bath in preparation for the union. This illustrates an 11th century liturgical poem. So while the manuscript is 15th century, the liturgical poem is 11th century. And this section, which is being illustrated by the super cool image, in my opinion, is a section about such ritual baths appearing miraculously to allow women to immerse despite a Greek ban on purification practices. And the person who's published on this is Sarit Shalev Aini on the poem and on the illustrations in the manuscript. So let's go back to the source and the framing of the whole thing. So we make Sure to be extremely careful with ourselves, but prohibition because of impurity is so tum'ah, there is none. The phrasing of the beginning in Hebrew, is hard to grammatically translate to sound correct in English. The meaning is that we practice something which is not legally necessary, and yet we choose to carefully adhere to it as a rule. There is an early source from the school of Tchuan of Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, who died in the first year of the 12th century. Sorry, this source, this is an early source, the source which we're seeing, from the school, uh, from uh, the school in Troyes of Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, who died in the first years of the 12th century. But later rabbis in the same Rhineland city in which he studied, continued expressing the same ideas well into the late 12th century, with as much honesty about the fact that none of the prohibitions are anchored in impurity that can be countered. In the interest of time, I won't read this great source out loud, but I'm again very happy to return to it in the discussion. I'll just paraphrase. As you can see in the uh, bottom section on the right, um, the rabbi here, which is by far, by far my favorite um, Tosafist, is Avan Rabbi Eliezer Ben Natan. And he's talking about the fact that some people think that apart from the three things which are disallowed for the menstrual waiting woman to do for her husband, which is a pouring of the glass and washing of his face um, and, ha and hands and making of his bed, some people also refrain from eating food that she has made. And he's mentioning the fact that they refrain from eating the food um, if they saw her uh, making it. But if it's a question of impurity, there should be no difference between her touching the food in his presence or outside of his presence. And he's reiterating the fact that those three things are things which uh, could lead to a sexual encounter. So if you can think of the intimacy of, you know, washing his face, pouring his glass of wine and making his bed, it's there are examples to show that they shouldn't be doing anything in, with an intimate nature in the household, which could um, lead to a sexual encounter before she had um, immersed. He's making it very, very clear that purity and impurity are no longer practiced in this time. And it's because um, they shouldn't uh, uh, come uh, uh, together. And that is the word. So these, oh, sorry, uh, sometimes um, um, things jump around because I work with the Macintosh and which is PowerPoint. Um, these same sources express a broader worldview according to which all community members are perpetually impure, men, women, and anyone else. Yet the context of the discussion itself makes it clear that people were carrying out habits intended to amplify the presence of purity concepts, separations, and re-engagement. So um, there are some women who prevent themselves from entering the synagogue during the days of their separation, and they don't need to do this. Indeed, why do they do it? If they think that the synagogue is like the temple, 
And even after immersion, why do they enter it, right? Because there's a, lim a limit on the, um, uh, uh, on the internal areas in the temple which women could enter. And if it's not like an em a temple, well, then enter and enter, I'm menstruating or not. For we're all contaminated by semen and corpse contamination and either contagion, I didn't know how to translate sheret, but if anyone has a good translation, I prefer. Um, and we enter the synagogue. So they're saying, you know, all the men are impure and we're all entering the synagogue all the time. So what's the point? Therefore, you learn it's not like a temple and they can enter the menstruating women, just like the men are entering despite being uh, impure. However, in any case, it's a place of purity and nicely they do. You know, we're going to let it go. It's a place of purity and this is not a bad thing to be doing. And I think this is a good example of everything that I've been showing up to now. You know, we can't become pure, but it's a nice thing. We, we're going to go with it. Again, the author is explicit. While logical argumentation fails, the synagogue is not like a temple. If it was, none of us could enter, as impurity unites everyone in this specific era. Yet still, it's a place of purity, and nicely they do in refraining from entering during their menstruation. Elisheva Baumgarten has argued for the influence of the Christian habit of churching, refraining from entering the church during menstruation. She's also shown that a parallel source, parallel to uh, this source, and coming from the same circle, Zafut de Beirashi, includes a similar passage that ends with praise also for men, so not just the women who nicely do, but also for men who are careful about semen. Again, despite there not being any means to reach an actual state of purity. For me, it seems like the rabbis are maybe presenting a model of a vector, praise for striving towards purification, even when there is agreement that this is an unattainable end. This issue, the value in acting as if purification works, when objectively it can, returns in other immersion situations. The 13th century source, this 13th century source, is about the immersion of all men in preparation for the Day of Atonement, before the beginning of the holiday in the fact. So for immersion on the Eve of Atonement, he doesn't need to bless, as it doesn't come to purity. And Rabbi Tzchak interpreted that anyone who blesses on the immersion on the Eve of Atonement has blessed a blessing for nothing. And we can argue about all my translations. I'm an architectural historian, so bracha uh, lebatela. For purifying men, a vain blessing. I'm happy to argue about my translations and learn to do them better. For purifying men, the conclusion here is the same. Purification is impossible, but the direction across halachic compilations is to carry out the right nonetheless, to immerse without a blessing. Not blessing would be a reminder that actual purification was not achieved, and therefore one should not bless if nothing has happened. Like the change from unattractive clothes for women, the immersion before the Day of Atonement was also, also followed by a change to clean clothes or to white clothes. It depends, there are different sources. I want to just think about it spatially. So here's the um, entrance to the ritual bath in Shpaya, which we saw the um, section of earlier in the photo of the water. And here is the synagogue. And um, the houses are uh, uh, around. So people will be coming from the street into uh, the court, entering uh, the ritual bath. And if inside the water, after their immersion, they would be changing into clean or white clothes, then people who are exiting the bath would have a different um, uh, visual consonance and have been uh, walked in there. And there are preparation spaces, waiting spaces in these baths in Spire. And you can see uh, by the human scale that there, it's, it's quite big. Like, you know, a person can't even um, reach uh, uh, side to side. This is quite different than standard uh, ritual baths, Jewish ritual baths, at least for women uh, today. From my architectural perspective, all of this is important. Imagine people walking into the ritual baths in one set of clothes and coming out of it resplendent in their white or clean holiday attire, whatever white meant in the 12th century which I think is also an important point to find out and um, possibly a future collaborative project. In wet hair, a sense of renewal after bathing in very cold water and arrives back to daylight after the descent into groundwater well below street level. Here it's 12 meters below uh, street level, the deepest is 25. Like the monumental space, the white clothes were also a visual marker, creating a semblance of purity and preparation for the spiritual work of the important day and spreading out into the small streets occupied by Jews around the synagogue. So you can see here again the proximity between the ritual baths and the synagogue. And then you can see it on the map. Well, probably not very well on the map, but it gives you kind of an idea of how having um, these uh, uh, directions of uh, everyone coming, immersing, coming out um, uh, in white clothes would make the time, would make the liturgical time visibly um, um, clear in space, despite uh, the difference of the uh, Jewish time um, from the Christian to the full time, kind of gives it uh, a visual presence. 
Thus far, we've looked at irreversible impurity, but at the same time, purification ceremonies for men and women, which leave them impure, but spiritually and physically renewed. I'm not presenting today a genre of text called exemplum, but if I was, we would find their stories of men and women careful about washing away blood and semen and being rewarded with children who became scholars or other transcendental acknowledgements of their miraculous, of their meticulous cleansing and its values. What, however, about Christians and Christianity? We began hearing about this uh, uh, this morning. The Igdaliyahu Alon, whose name uh, you heard in the first um, uh, talk, examined the question of impurity and the Gentiles in late antiquity. So it shows that while official doctrine sees no impurity in specific with meeting with persons in connection uh, um, with no Jews, or at least that it's complicated. There was, however, a persistent current of return to the question, suggesting some discomfort, maybe on the ground, with the fact that contact with Gentiles was not exactly defined as resulting in impurity. An echo of these sentiments studied by Alon perhaps underlay some of the medieval attitudes to the same issue. Namely, did contact with Christians impart impurity? And if so, what type of contact and what should be done about it. These worries seem to underlie a ceremony that Ephraim Kanarfogel and Paul Tartikoff have studied and which Kanarfogel calls reconversion or re-Judaizing, re to use a term from one of his sources. From the 12th century, there's evidence that in order to return to Judaism after conversion to Christianity, Jews were sometimes, or to Islam, were sometimes required to undergo a ceremony of purification presumably to purge them of this tainted period in their past. The details of re echoed other purification practices. However, rabbis pondered in treatises what it was that the Chinese were purifying from. Was contact with Christianity really impurity? And if so, what were the ramifications from Jew for Jews living within a Christian majority and in contact with Christians all the time? Were they purifying from something else? Sin had already been associated with um, impurity in late antiquity. In the high Middle Ages, some rabbis who prescribed immersions for a need asked what sin specifically needed washing away. This is something which I'm grappling a lot with, with this issue of sin and immersion. So regarding these repentant people who were accustomed to immerse, as I said in a vote of Natan, late antique text in chapter two, and this is quoted in um, loads of uh, Balea's Sophist um, response regarding the question of Judaism. An event occurred, and this is the quotation, so that's why I've marked it out. He's quoting from Avot Rabbi Natan. An event occurred regarding a young woman who was captured, and after they, her community, her Jewish community, ransomed her back, they immersed her. It's, a, it's kind of in the passage, it's Biluha. Um, as all, in all those days, she was found amongst them, amongst the Gentiles, depending on the manuscript variation. She used to eat of theirs and drink of theirs, and now they immersed her, the community which she was returning to, to purify her. And I have interpreted, so this is now the question, what they were immersing her of, right? In order for her to be purified from the sin, so it's explaining, not meaning from defilement by food called in vessels that have not been purified, because the unclean vessels of Gentiles do not impart impurity on the body more than other transgression, but to repent in purity. So, um, there are different sources which come back to the same issue. Some of them explain that it could be a fear of any sexual contact between um, in, in this uh, uh, original story and for people who had become uh, non-Jews for a certain period of time. In some cases, it's not the eating of food which um, um, was uh, the, gen the food of the Gentile, but the issue of not keeping Shabbatot, I think I have that yeah, in manuscript. Um, so you can see, I'm going to read in the Hebrew just for a second for people who um, uh, who can read. Um, up there, on the okay, Meshumad Agufer Baika Nishtamed, Tarei Kufar Al Kola Torah Kula, on the right side, and then explaining what he had to do. He shouldn't eat, he, um, um, he shouldn't eat meat, Loy Chal Basar, and he shouldn't drink wine, and he shouldn't go to parties. And I'm going up to the top left. Ad Shi Tbor, Tarei Chi Tbor. Okay, so they're saying so they're they're lumping in everything together. 
So he has to do all these kind of essentials. He has to sit in cold water for the length of time it takes to um, uh, fry an egg and eat it, which is um, the length of time. Uh, anyway, well, um, and he um, he has to then uh, wash in forty sea, which means he has to immerse in a specified um, ritual bath. He's explaining because you know what he did. He didn't keep the Sabbath. And he had sexual relations with uh, women who were non uh, uh, Jews. And you know what? He just did everything which is um, bad. And so, for all these sins, um, he has to make penance, but also complete it with immersion. It's like, it, it, it's like um, a, a process. It's, it's not everything that's bad. Akita is the things that biblically he would be cut off from his people, according to the Bible, or Mutolik is things that are being deemed with sin sin today. So it's so the most not terrible, just not just everything yeah. bad, but the most, most terrible very things specific. which should be punishable. Uh, Deborah's uh, point is a very, very good point because one of the things which seems to be very complicated for the rabbis and it turns in the sources is that they have no way of punishing people. They don't have uh, the jurisdiction in order to give people actual punishments, even though these are deserved from a biblical uh, legal point of view. And so one of the ways that immersion is functioning is that it's instead of punishment in some ways. So there seemed to also have been an element of return to the community after rupture and public acting out of contrition for having left it in the first place, left the community. This seems to emerge from a Christian account of the same ceremony that appears in a 14th century so-called Inquisitor's Manual by Bernardi, published in Allies by Yosef Fayim. Ah, I had it all translated in the first Okay. <laughs> and this is just to show that there are other examples of going to the same story of the Votar of Yimatan, uh, uh, and it returns for uh, different cases. Here it's the case of uh, women who um, became uh, Christian. And now um, the question is, what kind of ceremony does it have to be for their children as uh, she wants to come back to Judaism um, and how uh, this has to be uh, handled? Does it need a betin? Does it not need a betin? Um, and that's in the same uh, manuscript um, which we saw earlier, um, 692 Bodhi and um, um, okay. So um, this seems to emerge from a Christian account of the same ceremony that appears in the 14th century so-called Inquisitor's Manual by Bernardi, published in annual and analyzed by Yosef Chaim Yerushan. Here I think we can see some elements of public humiliation or self-humbling, even some physical hurt as part of atonement and return. Let's read one of, um, there are three of these, uh, together and think about the poetics of a ceremony meant to wash away one's past, one's sin, one's adjunct religious identity. Remember, the returning person is nude as we're thinking about the ceremony, while others are clothed. The repenting person would have to descend into the water and be lower than everyone else. And there's some element of humiliation, but also a reacceptance and even a physical embrace by the representatives of the community. So this is a description by Bernard Gates, first in the scripture. He is to be rejudiced as someone been asked by one of the Jews present whether he wishes to submit to be left in Hebrew, which in Latin means whether he wishes to take a bath or wash in running water in order to become, to become a Jew. After this, he stripped of his garments and is sometimes bathed in warm water. They shave his head and afterwards put him in the waters of a flowing stream and plunge his head in the water three times. And some of these small details which are in the rabbinic descriptions, um, giving Yerushalmi the um, confidence to say that this probably reflects uh, some kind of um, 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 ceremony that was done on the ground. This done, he emerges from the water, dons a new shirt and breeches, and all the attending Jews kiss him and give him a name, which is usually the name he had before baptism. From then on, he lives and acts as a Jew and attends the school or the synagogue um, of uh, the Jews. So that's the embrace that I was uh, talking about um, after also the, the kind of new identity and the new name. Is this a rule of law? Uh, well, it's a good question. Um, it's a good question. According to Yerushalmi, the description of the Jewry Judaizing rite was repeated almost verbatim in a Directorium Inquisitorum composed in 1376 by Aragonese Inquisitor Nicolas. Putting aside the Christian authorship, what these inquisitors were trying to gain, there's enough congruent evidence in Hebrew sources to take the description very seriously. We can see here a mechanism for a turn from rupture, which arguably comes up in a whole spectrum of emerging questions, like the woman we saw with a similar context but which also comes as a general statement when Rabbi Tzach ben Moses, author of the compilation Or Zarua, quotes Rabbi Simcha of, Sp of Shfair as saying that all emer oh sorry that's all oh yeah, yeah that's all emer <laughs> uh, that's all repentant 
uh, persons need immersion. This is only the first fifth of a long response on this matter, which is a whole conversation in itself. The way the source work have taken apart just the top bit of it is that it keeps referencing out to other compilations, only in this top bit of a question, already three cited sources which deserve analysis in their own right. So despite generalization, I will just say that the whole thing is about what sin is, where it is recorded, and what can be done about it. What the relationship is between divine forgiveness and human reacceptance, what tools leaders have for helping fix ruptures by walking a person through contrition, atonement, and return. The basic underlying assumption is this, that life includes sin, it includes mistakes, a cycle of separation and reuniting, physical, spiritual, carnal, and transcendental. In conclusion, a stable idea of impurity does not have to govern set laws for purification practices. Without looking at the sanitation of the collective past, I've tried to look at mechanisms for restoring personal, physical, and spiritual purity. These work not by blotting out the past or ignoring it or trying to say that it didn't happen, but by acknowledging the sin and preparing for a better future. And we can go into detail of this uh, source in order to explain what I'm basing this on. The spaces which I work on, in my opinion, go far towards making the transformation visible and experiential, if admittedly by the rabbis themselves, not fully objective. Simply put, life includes the yucky stuff as well. There's no escaping it. Yeah. Um, what one can do is to perpetually strive to follow what they can within the borders of purity, despite not ever, ever being able to reach beyond a certain point. And whatever the situation calls for it, to be willing to strip down, submerge, and raise renewed from the water. And because the experiential aspects are fully connected to what the ceremonies are about, to what I think the buildings are trying to do to them, to what the, script, the descriptions are trying to achieve, I had to bring a bit of an experience. <laughs> How cold is cold? It's very, very, very cold. Very, 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 very cold. It's the river, Captain. And super deep. It's a meter 90. You can't tell, but then you kind of just walk beyond the last step and it's like, hey. <laughs> 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 Sorry. So if we read the last sentence, um, what one can do is to perpetually strive to follow what they can within the borders of purity, despite not ever being able to reach beyond a certain point, and whenever the situation calls for it, to be willing to strip down, submerge, and rise renewed from the water. Of course, only until next time. Thank you. We have a little shy of 10 minutes for Thank you. It's really, really fascinating. Um, so if everyone is impure after the destruction of the temple, um, are they, so what do you purify? So it, <coughs> is there any recognition that um, impurity and purification is real in, in a strict legal sense? And are there sort of nesting boxes of purity? Can you be generally impure because touching corpses and semen and things, but then you can at least purify from other things. Is it the same kind of purity that you get from a corpse and menstruation? And so you can do the menstruation impurity, but you're still uh, impure for the other thing. Or is this all sort of making us feel better or sin? And is there like, is the moral and moral aspect a different kind of distinguished from the, the, the physical material aspect of purity. So I think they're both. I think the biblical models already show that they're both. This is the kind of um, source um, uh, which we have here. And the author uh, trying to understand what to do with someone who's accidentally um, um, killed someone else's uh, uh, child goes to the question of uh, David and Psalm 51. And in Psalm 51, you can see that um, David, you can see at the top for whoever reads Hebrew, uh, David is begging uh, to be cleansed from his sin. And then the author, uh, Moses, uh, um, Rabbi uh, um, Isaac ben Moses, is asking, but what do you mean cleanse me? You know, David hasn't, uh, hasn't uh, become impure. He hasn't touched anything impure. It's obviously a question of sin. And so they're pointing out that the biblical models already encapsulate an overlap between the issue of sin and the kind of more Levitical questions of purity, which are more objective and more embodied and more corporeal. 
And I think the um, uh, medieval rabbis are using this in order to expand immersion to include something which has a spiritual pro process. But and that that's, wasn't, that's not the case for menstruation, right? It's not the case for menstruation. For menstruation, they have to be careful about impurity. But many of the sources don't say she has to uh, become pure. They say she has to purify. They don't say she has to uh, become pure. They have to say she, that she has to be careful about uh, purification laws. They do define the community as a pure community versus Christian community because of the carefulness about the uh, menstrual laws. But they do say that the issue isn't contagion. So a man should not touch his wife, not because he will get extra, extra, you know, uh, bleeding impurity plus his already semen and corpse contamination, but because it can be his sex. And the earlier the rabbis, the more explicit they are about this. The later rabbis, the more they mask it and try to show kind of different ways of um, like, like, Consular, like a music consular, with things that you can be like really improve with this stuff, but also take this one up and down as you go. Because, sorry, just to, well, because in Islam, it's mainly, you know, the physical impurity is to do with prayer. So if you can't, if you're not ritually pure, then your prayer is invalid. And so it's a very, and the moral one is, is a different level. I'm not sure if you're, yeah. I don't know, but they do right. They do overlap because, for example, in directions for uh, people who lead the prayer for um, Yom Kippur, they say, no, go and um, and um, immerse if you're leading the prayer and it's Yom Kippur itself and um, you've had um, an eternal emission of semen because we need you to feel as if you're pure. Mm -hmm. That's not the exact word they use, but it's um, it's the gist of mm -hmm. the thing. You have to feel as if you're pure as you're going in there. Interesting. Um, thank you. Um, just uh, just a thought. Um, the the notion of a move from punishment to penitence. Mm -hmm. um, we heard about it yesterday in next leg and Wednesday uh, in the discussion on next leg and Wednesday, and I'm I'm wondering if if it's what are your thoughts on this? Because obviously it appears also in in Jewish spheres of uh, discussion. <laughs> So here it's a big thing because uh, this is a um, uh, very very tough part of the source which um, I didn't have uh, I, I couldn't go into because of its um, um, length. So one of the things he says, you know, that one of the things that we can't uh, uh, do to him, you know, we can't try him, we can't punish him, we can't give him any of the um, any of the uh, punishments which uh, in the Bible he was uh, supposed to uh, undergo, and so we have to do something different. And then the way that he uh, brings this out, and I don't have the whole uh, quote here. This says, okay, a person has to undergo internal contrition, chuva, and once that's done, he is actually fully okay. We should accept him back. But there's also some in, um, uh, penance which has to be done, and this is where immersion comes into the story. And then he says, this is why Rabbi Sinchav Shvai says that every um, repentant person has to undergo immersion. So then he unpacks that for like five pages and explains the difference between the internal contrition which has to erase everything that's going back and the external um, action and reacceptance by the community, which is um, making everything uh, uh, forward uh, be um, okay. It seems to me at least quite parallel to, to what would be a Christian mechanism of, uh, or, or maybe it's not surprising at all. Maybe it's just- uh, It's a whole parallel. Mm -hmm. Baumgartner has already written about the, the, the mutual influence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is something mm -hmm. there. That, um, how it works exactly. Started. Mm -hmm. I think I can say about that, that, for example, um, setting out to work on immersion ceremonies, one would expect that they would be completely differentiated from baptism. And as much as the um, uh, ceremonies uh, converge quite seriously um, um, from um, an early uh, point, but then if you look at immersion, not of women who are um, cleansing themselves from bleeding, but for example, of people who are repentant and want to atone uh, from sin, there are some um, uh, overlaps which can be thought about. Also um, with specific language, for example, used by um, Jews who um, who have baptized. And then um, there's just the one uh, um, example of, um, of the so-called uh, uh, biography of Herman the Jew, who also writes about his um, experiences, if we believe that to be a biography, which is a whole different conversation. And then um, the way that he's setting up whatever is happening in, in the font is not fully um, different from actually such sources as Bernard Gee and some rabbinic sources about re-Judaizing. So there are two more questions. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, I'd like to return to X question because it seemed to me that you you didn't really answer what he was asking. Is that there's something uh, that there are differing levels or different kinds yeah. of impurity, and obviously the purity of the level required to go into the temple, well, that can't be obtained. The issue of menstrual impurity and purity of the family is something that's a totally separate biblical injunction and was kept, and it is recited with a blessing. So it is actually a purification. And of course, as you well know, the words that the, the person looking to make sure that you did it properly says is, and you are pure. Yeah. So that's what he was asking. So there is a purification from something there. It's not just like uh, with the guy before Yom Kippur who says, well, yeah, I can't be totally ritually pure to go in and offer the sacrifice of the people. This is a different kind of impurity, and there is a purification from it. I think you're absolutely right, but I also think the rabbis are grappling. We saw that um, source from Rabban, which we can go back to. And I think, as I say, the earlier the rabbis are, the more complicated they uh, they make it. Even see on the top, the Tvila Beniga Lokhiv, and the Lokhra Meshar Tnaim, the Ketuv Lokhat Vaman Lokhor Psalom. And you know this is to be true, right? You know, so they're grappling with the question of the Nidah doesn't need purification in the Beit HaKobera because it's only the Zaba. Yes. And of course, everyone is to fix Zaba because the women can't uh, differentiate between Nidah and Zaba, but they're still worrying about this question. And they're worrying about the question of how come it doesn't pass naturally and why we need purification. And they're also making the point. Mishun um, Tum'ah. No, the extras, only the Zaba needs the extra days. No, also the Zavani's purification. Yes, she does back. too, but in other words, the menstruating does too. Well, it's we the question of about the, this the addition. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the the integration between the Kabbalah and the sources, one of your earliest sources, yeah, what do we have? Well, yes, not really. It's the one that's quoted within the yeah, yeah. text, but yeah. yeah. If you go earlier, the second time you do it, they also show that according to the sex mm -hmm. cut, there is purification for the soul. Yeah. But you can't find it in the Roman literature at all. It doesn't exist. And this is the reason that you need a body of blood, which is very late. Mm -hmm. It's just junk there. And then it's, it comes again at your age, because of the ashes, I suppose. So it's kind of, it was the, at the second time of the period. It went to the Christianity and not to the rabbis, and then it came back, maybe from the Christianity, or from the communist. Forget, forget, from someone who came to be a Jew, which must purify in the And the question why does he purify? Is it just a ceremony or to erase all, all what we have done in the, the temple? Mm -hmm. I don't want to answer because I think the time is up, correct? Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> but thank you. I think we don't need dessert, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So our next speaker is uh, one from uh, Debs, um, who is an expert on uh, Judaism in Spain, uh, on which she has published extensively. I will not even attempt a summary. Um, but he's also uh, an editor of the college, conducted comparative studies in the pre modern monarchies. Uh, that was uh, 2013. Uh, he's the author of a comparative uh, monograph on the beginnings of Carolingian and Abbasid rule. Uh, he's been a professor of French cultural and medieval history in uh, New since uh, 2011, the president of the German Medieval Association. Uh, um, and then this year, uh, since 2017, um, and he has a current project on Christian brother Muslim and uh, Al Andalus. And his paper today, as you can see, is on uh, purity as an element of anti Islamic discourse in the 9th century Cordoba. Or I had a different I think under slideshow. Mm -hmm. Sorry. See where it's the slide yeah. slides. Oh, this this one. The bottom right. Yeah. yeah. Bottom right. Is this one here? Yeah. yeah. The sliding scale. The last icon. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Perfect. This one. Yeah. This one. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Thanks for your help. Sorry. And I'm technical expert. 
Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I slightly changed the title to include a source from the 10th century, so that's the reason why it's slightly different. In Visigothic Christianity, purity does not seem to have been a prevailing concern. When Catholic Christians in Spain established and promoted their orthodoxy against Aryan rivals, primary importance was attached to dogmatic issues of Christology. Even more important was the theological discourse directed against the Jews in the seventh century. Anti-Jewish arguments drawn mainly from late antique treatises, focusing on issues of the coming of the Messiah, the observance of holidays, circumcision and dietary laws. In this last case, Christian theologians argued in favor of the spiritual observance of such prescriptions, that is, in the figurative sense. For example, abstention from pork was meant to refer to abstention from any kind of behavior that might be perceived as asso associated with pigs. So this is the thing of uh, ritual and moral impurity. Such purity discourse was directed at most at the purity of the Christian heart, but not at the so-called literal observance of dietary and purity laws, let alone regulations of bodily purity. A special case in point is the anti-Jewish treatise by Ilde Francis of Toledo and the perpetual virginity of the Virgin Mary. The Metropolitan Treatise, the Metropolitan of Toledo, directs this treatise against three imaginary adversaries, two heretics from the fourth century and an unnamed Jew who receives the bulk of the writer's criticism and theological, theological objections. The virginity of Mary before giving birth during birth and after it, is defended with reference to biblical quotations and patristic literature. The argument is not very original, but it is the very first Mariological work of medieval Latin theology. As regards purity, it is again not discussed as an issue to be observed by believers, it is rather attached to the Theotokos, the mother of God, who was, by divine grace, able to preserve the bodily purity intact in contrast to any other mother. On the other hand, impurity is blamed on the Jewish adversary. The primary concern of Visigothic theology involved dogmatic issues related to the Trinity and Christology, to biblical exegesis, including eschatology, and in one instance, as said, also to Mariology. Purity laws mattered only as part of Holy Scripture. They were, they were interpreted according to the manifold sense of scripture, mostly referring to the moral level. In Islamic Al-Andalus, uh, things changed after the Muslims came there in the 8th century. In the Corpus Scriptorum Musavaritorum, we find a curious letter directed against those who claim that blood is impure. Apparently, there were now Christian opponents who objected to the consumption of food containing remnants of blood and who avoided any contact with human or animal blood, observing dietary and purity laws according to the literal sense. This Christian group, perceived as heretical by the author, may have been influenced by Jewish or Islamic regulations. At least, Members read Old Testament prescriptions in the literal sense. Looking at the practice of Jewish or Islamic ritual observance in everyday life, these Christians apparently rejected the traditional Christian insistence on the exclusively spiritual exegesis of biblical commandments referring to purity, insisting instead on the literal observance of such prescription also by Christians. The author of the treatise deemed such an approach as heretical, as threatening the integrity of Christian faith and undermining the hermeneutic traditions of patristic theology. The author refers to Gregory the Great and his exegesis of the biblical injunctions concerning priests with corporeal flaws, which rendered them unfit or impure according to Mosaic law. The author quotes Gregory, uh, quotes, quotes St. Paul, letter to Titus 1.15, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are completely defiled and corrupted, nothing is pure. Concerning the abstention from blood, the author concludes, this is, is the sangui seen known opera sanguinis. He recommends that everything created by God should be received with facts. So I won't go into it, we can discuss it later at that time. 
Apparently, the insistence on the exclusively spiritual exegesis of many parts of the Old Testament was no longer convincing to some Spanish Christians after the downfall of the Visigothic Church hierarchy. This is evident also from the wording of the Council of Cordoba, whose acts have been preserved in a codex from Leon written during the 9th century. Referring to the her heresy of the Casianistas, qui se ab esquis gentilium abstinent tamquam in munda reputantes. Something rejected by the fathers of this council, who again refer to St. Paul. They even point out that Jesus used to eat with sinners and tax collectors, arguing against social distancing and practices of differentiation based on habits of behavior. On the other hand, the fathers do uphold marriage restrictions, which serve as a social boundary to preserve group cohesion. The fathers reject incest polygamy, and marriage of Christian girls to non-Christians. This brings me to my next part on Eulogius and Paulus Alvarez of Cordoba. In Islamic Al-Andalus, bishops were still in charge of their communities, but Islamic authorities now held them responsible for the collection of taxes. What is more, bishops were now installed with the connivance of Islamic authorities. They were appointed with their consent which on occasion could also be withheld, as in the case of Eulogius, who was elected to be Archbishop of Toledo, but who was unable to assume his office. As in the whole of Iberia Lislam, bishops had to cooperate with Muslim authorities who held them responsible for the behavior of their flocks. A growing sense that the integrity of Christian faith came under threat under Islamic rule can also be perceived in the work of the aristocratic writer Paulus Alvarez from Cordoba. In his famous correspondence with the Jewish convert, Rodo Eleazar, who fled to Muslim Spain after his conversion to Judaism, Alvarez initially tries to win Eleazar back to the Christian code, but the former Frankish cleric rejects such attempts, point to his disillusion, pointing to his disillusionment at the Frankish court caused by immoral behavior, strife, and dissenting opinions. As Paulus Alvarus was trying to uphold the ideals inherited from the Visigothic past, including Latin education, Roman traditions, and Visigothic theology, he felt that these ideals associated with Catholic normativity were threatened by a convert but deliberately rejected such Christian values, opting for a life as a Jew under Muslim domination. Apparently, Eleazar preferred to live as a Zimni, a protected Jew under Islamic law, to a life as a cleric at the court of Emperor Louis the Pious. Eleazar's example was a potential danger to any attempts to uphold the integrity of Christian tradition in Islamic Al-Andalus. Among his invectives hurled at the convert, Alvarez suggests sarcastically that Eleazar ought to, ought to have chosen Islam instead of Judaism, since this would have allowed him to marry even more wives than permitted under Jewish law. <laughs> Trying to defend ideas rooted in the Roman and Visigothic past, Alvarez attempts to uphold the integrity and purity of tradition, on occasion even using obscene language. Alvarez and his friend, the priest Alogius, are most famous for their writings in support of the Cordoban martyrs. At the middle of the 9th century, more than 40 Christians were put to death by the Islamic authorities because they had derogated Islam and the Prophet Muhammad in public. After the first executions, Alogius became a kind of spiritual advisor to some of the would-be martyrs, encouraging them to hold on to their Christian faith also in adversity. In the end, Alogus himself was arrested for providing shelter to a Christian fugitive, and he also suffered martyrdom. Alvarez wrote his vita after his death. Alogus and Alvarez supported the group of future martyrs, which was later perceived as being an anti-Islamic movement, directed against entanglement with Arabic culture and Islamic religious practice. While a large group of martyrs came from rigidly mixed families, others originated from monasteries and basilicas on the outskirts of Cordoba, where they dedicated themselves to ascetic practices. The case in point is Isaac, a former official at the Umayyad court, who left his post as Exceptore Publica to withdraw to the monastery of Tabanos, 
where he dedicated himself to ascetic practices for three years, studying scriptures and leading a life in prayer. According to Kenneth Baxter Wolf, this may have been an act of repentance, which was later extended in form of a public outburst against Islam, leading to execution, which may be interpreted as the final consummation of repentance. With regard to the issue of purity, Isaac's withdrawal from court life into the monastery, from the city to the countryside, from the forum to the wilderness, can be perceived as an act of disentanglement, rejecting refined Arabic culture in favor of pure Christian traditions as cultivated on the periphery of urban life. Monasticism provided a shelter to practice discipline and asceticism, to study the Christian fathers and to cultivate Latin learning as cherished by Paulus Alvarez. Renouncing court life and the Islamic environment, a future martyr demonstrated his or her adhesion to an allegedly pure culture of Visigothic Christianity. Christians such as Eulogius and Paulus Alvarez, critical of the perceived collaboration of the church authorities with the Umayyad regime, were also critical of the Episcopal administration. For some time, Ologius even refused to celebrate mass, allegedly because the bishop and other senior clerics had collaborated with Islamic authorities. The precise circumstances are unclear, but his spectacular withdrawal from sacerdotal practice was an act of protest, again directed against associating with Islamic authorities. Another example is provided by Abbot Samson of Cordoba, who was highly critical of Bishop Ostergesis of Malaga, whom he recuperated as incompetent, uneducated, and lacking knowledge. Ologius includes a polemic biography of the prophet Muhammad in his Liber Apologeticus Martyrum. Mahomet is presented as an imposter, a pseudo-prophet who mingles various religious traditions and practices in order to invent a new cult, an impure mixture typical of any kind of heresy. Heresies were often imagined as originating from alien influences, and the, pres the presentation of the origin of Islam by Elogios and Alvarez is a telling example. Case in point is the violent language of circumcision and purification used by Alvarez in the introduction to his Indiculus Luminosum. Require domine lingua seculari que no confecte prepucium et illo igne mentis mea immunda secretum, quo sanctorum corda nosti conflare, quo martyrum affectionis principalita creteris inflamare. Could you please translate that? Oh, yeah. So, I think, and then maybe so, people can read okay. that. Can yeah. read the, so, uh, uh, so it, uh, it basically says that the, it's a call on the, uh, the Lord to, uh, to, uh, to cut off the uh, prepucium, which is the, the foreskin, uh, on, and uh, to, to illuminate the mind uh, so that the, um, the, uh, the, the, the hearts of the, the, sanct the, the, the sanctified people can be inflamed and the, the affection of the martyrs can be inflamed by, by, by the faith. So the important point is that the, the circumcision is implied to the heart and uh, uh, the Lord is called upon to, to practice circumcision on the, the, uh, the future martyrs that have, that have been inflamed, inflamed by faith. Mm -hmm. Instances of cultural hybridization are often perceived by orthodox theologians. Uh, what about this? Uh, sorry. According to Alvarez, Muhammad is an imperissimus vate, so an impure prophet, and Islam is referred to in the same language. It's, Islam is called an impure sect. Uh, uh, yeah, it's basically the language seen the best. Uh, Instances of cultural hybridization are often perceived by orthodox theologians as leading to religious impurity. A particularly drastic example are allusions to acts of circumcision, allegedly practiced by some Andalusian Christians in order to conform to the requirements of Islamic court life. Samson of Cordoba denounces this adaptation to Islamic practice as an act of impurity, even though he was himself familiar with the Islamic environment, as shown by his service as an interpreter and translator. Of diplomatic correspondence. In spite of his knowledge of Arabic, Samson denounces Christian circumcision as a glaring an example of illicit entanglement. After the collapse of the Visigothic monarchy and the institutional backing provided by the court to episcopal administration, the spiritual authority and the institutional charisma of bishops were severely undermined. 
when acting in cooperation with the Islamic regime, the Episcopal administration even appeared to be a branch of the non-Christian regime. In such circumstances, the individual charisma of ascetics gained new credence. People who renounced office withdrew from public life to search for true knowledge in monasteries set in suburban and rural surroundings acquired the spiritual authority of true Christians who strove for the preservation of the integrity and purity of their faith. In monastic seclusion, they practiced individual asceticism, striving for spiritual perfection and self-empowerment as witnesses to Christian truth. Such self-performance reached its culmination when they emerged out of their monasteries into public life, into mosques and Islamic courts to denounce the alleged seductions of the Islamic pseudo prophet and his followers. These acts of paresia, of free speech, were both an indictment of Islam and a defense of the integrity and purity of Christianity. In the court in front of the Kedi, the martyrs were witnesses of Christian truth, preserving its integrity against all invitations to embrace Islam and save their lives. When recounting the stories of the martyrs, Olovius and Paulus Alvarez promote examples of individual performance and self-empowerment understood as an answer to God's call. Against Episcopal collaboration with Umayyad authorities and against the majority of lukewarm Christians, who were mainly critical of the alleged martyrs, Logios and Paulus Alvarez try to substantiate new acts of charismatic performance and asceticism which are meant to create the illusion of returning to the heroic age of persecution during the early church. This brings me to my last example from the 10th century, the legend of the boy Pelagius. Things are different in the 10th century legend of Saint Pelagius. This legend is transmitted in three sources. In the account of the Spanish priest Raguel, in a poem composed by the German nun Ratzwied of Gandersheim from Eternal Saxony, in which I'm going to concentrate, and in a liturgical text of Leon, possibly composed to mark the advent of the relics of Pelagius to the royal city of the north, Leon. According to the legend, the Christian boy is sent as a hostage from Galicia to the court of Caliph Abderrahman III of Cordoba, described by Ratzwied as a Clarum Decus Orbis. Urbs Augusta Nova Marcus Vericata Superba. So uh, the city of Cordova is a, uh, the ornament as a world, as it says in another place, a, an August uh, imperial city, and an, um, it is uh, super, superb by the new ferocity of Mars, the, the, the god of, um, uh, of the war, of course. The Christian youth steadfastly rejects all invitations by the caliph to convert. The Islamic ruler is presented as the doucherous. He offers precious robes, which are immediately thrown off by the Christian. He presents young boys as partners, which are equally rejected at once. The caliph even touches the boy, apparently a hint at sexual advances, who steadfastly defends his bodily and spiritual purity. Finally, Pelagius is martyred to death. Pratzwit presents the caliph as a tyrant. Uh, the caliph is even referred to as flawed or stained. Uh, the ruler is blamed for devouring the bodies of his Christian victims. From the imperial perspective, everyone has to submit to imperial rule. The sexual desires of the tyrant are mentioned explicitly. Uh, so, uh, but Pelagius, as I said earlier, refuses to be stained by impure love. So the Miles Christi, the young boy, rejects all invitations of the, uh, the impure invitations of the pagan king. Interestingly, the supreme Muslim ruler himself makes him an appearance in this account. Whereas in the sources referring to the martyrs in the ninth century I referred to earlier, the Umayyad emirs never play an active role. In these earlier sources from the 9th century, the Islamic side is represented by Muslim judges. In some cases, also by people in the market and by fa Muslim family members in case of mixed families. In the legend of Pelagius, however, the caliph himself is the main actor on the Islamic side who invites the youth to embrace Islam 
but she will also attempt to commit sexual abuse. This open sexual component is missing in the earlier accounts. Possibly, the perception of Islam had changed in the eyes of some Christian subjects by the 10th century. At a time when Christian texts were increasingly, increasingly translated into Arabic, on the one hand, and when conversions to Islam accelerated on the other, some Christian authors felt their religion was coming under threat, to which they reached reacted by vilifying Islam and the Muslim authorities. We should note that two perhaps or three of the sources relating the legend of Elagius were composed under Christian rule. The souls both for the Saxon Manbot suite and for the Mozarabic liturgical text. Possibly also the earliest text composed by Raguel was written in northern Spain. The perception of Islam as debaucherous may have been a strategy to strengthen northern resistance to Muslim military advances. After all, it was Abdurrahman III who ended the period of civil strife in the Umayyad Emirate, marked by his adoption of the political title in 929, which led to a renewed military uh, activity against the Christian north. Henceforward, he was known as Anasi, the victorious, a claim countered by the legend recounting this defeat by a noble Christian boy upholding his religious and bodily purity. In the 10th century, Cordoba, uh, in the 10th century, Cordoba experienced a period of splendor. Embassies arrived both from Constantinople and from Ottonian Saxony, and Berber mercenaries from northern Africa swelled the ranks of the Caliphal troops, bolstering their military strength. Christians from the north apparently perceived an increasing threat from the south, which led to the regular payment of tributes to the Caliphal court. The Umayyad regime acquired imperial dignity and splendor, expressed by the construction of new mosques and palatial cities, as well as by the reception of diplomatic embassies from other imperial courts. At this time, the legend of Pelagius, possibly originating in northern Spain, was meant to counter the exaggerations of imperial splendor. The latest advances of the caliph against the Christian boy mirror the Umayyad advances to the Christian north of Spain. The martyr opposes his spiritual purity, even though his body is finally mutilated and executed. Maintaining his bodily purity and virginity, he unmasks Islamic advances as arising from illicit desire. Purity is used as an argument highlighting higher spiritual authority. The boy almost appears as another hermit and tenuous, who rejects the advances of every demon trying to seduce him. So if you have another 10 minutes, perhaps I'm not much. I sat five. Okay. Yeah. I will shut slightly for four minutes. On the one hand, hagiographers tried to stimulate resistance among Andalusian Christians against the Maya rule. On the other, authors in northern Spain and in Ottonian Germany marked off Christianity from its alleged rival and enemy, an Islamic empire, by blaming its ruler for sexual abuse and disrespectful behavior while presenting this ruler as ultimately incapable to overcome the resistance of an android, android boy, who prevailed against an individual martyr and witness to Christian truth. Uh, the sits and laden of this, this, uh, this Hagiographic discourse is the discourse of purity. It alleges that in the past, Christian culture, culture existed in a pure, uncontaminated form. From a historical perspective, such a claim is, of course, untrue, as it disregards the absorption of Hellenistic and Roman tradition by nascent Geo-Christianity. However, in the view of Andalusian Christians, Christianity had merged with the Roman culture. From the perspective of cultural domination of Roman Christianity, especially after the Third Council of Toledo in 589 and after the so-called Isidorian Renaissance of Visigothic Spain, the contributions of many different communities and traditions to Christian theology and culture faded from memory. Catholic tradition was now perceived from an imperial perspective as rather solidified, uniform, and stabilized. Christians maintaining the memories of Visigothic Christianity in Al Andalus disregarded two facts. First, the Visigothic church and theology had rested on many different foundations and its apparent power and unity had only been due to the institutional backing of the Visigothic monarchy. Once this political backing had broken down, church structures became increasingly fragile. 
when promoting purity, the hagiographers were not only denigrating Islam, but also the Christian majority, which accepted their status of the means as protected people living under Islamic domination. The idealization of purity was an appeal to act and to prepare for martyrdom, as evidenced by the treatise Documentum Marturiale, written by Elogius in captivity to strengthen the resolve of the Christian versions, Flora and Mary. Purity is a trope for tradition, reminding the recipients both of the heroic age of persecution and of the period of Christian domination in the Visigothic kingdom. To conclude, uh, in a situation when the Christian majority seemed to be comfortable with its life under Islamic domination, the geographers opted for differentiation from the environment. Asceticism implied a purification of the self, the reconfiguration of the own persona, and the ultimate acquisition of a new identity. This, in turn, provided the basis for self-empowerment, prophetic parousia, and the proclamation of alternative power. Anchoritic withdrawal to the peripheries of urban life initiated a process of purification, concentration, of spiritual rebirth, and of preparation for a return to public life. This return was carried through as an act of political and religious empowerment, witnessing to the integrity of Christian truth against any effort to seduce the hagiographic heroes to renounce their faith. By postulating a return to a state of Christian power, the hagiographers try to undermine the Umayyad system based on the collaboration of the Mis and their authorities. The future martyrs, empowered to speak up by their period of education and purification, unmask the pseudo prophet by proclaiming binary oppositions rooted in the conceptualization of two different orders truth against falsehood, purity against impurity, knowledge against error. Parisia inaugurates a revolution of power structures, at least in the eyes of the hagiographers and their respected audience. The purified person of the martyr calls for the purification of society at large. However, the majority of Christians failed to accept these hagiographic claims, pointing to the lack of miracles, to the monotheistic character of Islam, as opposed to Roman polytheism, and to the lack of persecution. Contrary to this, hagiographic discourse laid claim to the transformation of reality, but such transformations only happened in the imagination of the respective authors and their tiny flock of followers. The institutional church, represented by bishops and church councils, was less rigorous. However, certain rules were upheld, especially those referring to marriage restrictions, which provides a striking parallel to Islamic prescriptions. Church authorities were not only preoccupied by non-Christians, but also by various heresies, heresies which are dealt with in much greater detail in the Council of Cordoba mentioned earlier. The conduct of life was the arena where most of the differences became apparent. And in this field, the church tried to maintain rules meant to safeguard orthodoxy and purity. This is my last quote from the Council of Cordoba. They condemn uh, and the doctrine, uh, and uh, which is uh, perceived as being bad, and uh, which is trying to seduce the hearts of the faithful, and um, uh, they um, give in to the religion of those who profane the life, and uh, they lead a fanatical life. The fathers of the council admonished all heretics to return to the church, in sanctam ecclesiam qui non habit macula ne perugam. So the church is the one who is pure and does not have any uh, disfigurement. The orthodoxy of the ecclesiastical doctrine continued to be exemplified by metaphors referring to the realm of integrity and purity, proposing an immaculate concept of the church. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for, for, for your paper. I have two brief questions. One is, do you see um, in this hagiographical discourse any evidence of actual organic cult, or is this just some kind of academic exercise limited to a very uh, selective milieu of people? And secondly, is the hagiographical discourse at all connected to the adoptionist heresy? 
that lives in recent memory ongoing in spring? So the, the discourse created by Lagios and Alvaros is a minority discourse, as I explained, yeah. because the majority of, the, of Christians rejected the, the claim that they are martyrs at all. This was the very last thing that I said. They, the majority would point to the fact that there are no miracles, there is no persecution, and the religion of Islam is not polytheism, as in Roman chant. There are three points that are missing. Therefore, it's not perceived as being martyrdom by the majority of Christians. And the texts are preserved exclusively in Morgan's Spain. Right. So uh, my second example, the legend of Pelagius, possibly was written, the, the texts were written from, from the start in the north. The earlier example, texts were written in the south under Muslim domination, but they're preserved in the north. The relics of the martyrs were transferred to the north and venerated in the north. And some of the relics get brought to Paris, to Saint Germain d'Auxerre, and the chance of ward. So, and they get included into martyrology in the north and in Thuringian Francia. So, the point is the veneration of martyrs does not occur under Islam in southern Spain, it only occurs in northern Spain and in Thuringian Francia. So, the discourse is an intellectual discourse. Uh, they are trying to, to promote this as a, a return to a purified past, but their, their intended audience is not received the argument. The only people who receive it are located under Christian domination in northern Spain or in Carolingian Francia or even in Ottonian Germany. How do we know this? How... The, uh, there's only one codex where the... Um, so the, it's an argument in the from, it's, a, it's, a, it's an argument from the, from, 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 from the manuscripts. The manuscripts are preserved in the north. Uh, the manuscripts are not preserved in the south, and the relics are brought to the north and venerated in the north. So we have no evidence that, that uh, well, they may have been, but we have no evidence that right. there are manuscripts in the south. They are, we have no evidence that the, the, um, the, the relics are venerated in the south, but there is knowledge of these um, relics because there was an embassy of uh, Uzwar from Saint Germain d'Auxerre, and so sent under Charles Bolt. They, they were in, in, in search of the, uh, the relics of. St. Vincent of Zaragoza. Apparently, they did not get these relics, but they were directed by people in Zaragoza to the south. So, apparently, in Zaragoza, they knew about these recent martyrdoms or whatever it was. So, these Frankish oh. emissaries got knowledge of this when they were in Zaragoza and they traveled, which they had not attended originally, to the south to get the relics. And they heard of this in the north, and people in the south gave them away. So they might have kept them, but they apparently were, were happy or not happy to, to be part with the uh, relics and they were taken to the north. So there is no evidence of any cult of the relics in, in the south. It, it's been brought to the north. And the second question, the adoption is controversy. I don't think um, the, um, it had, had an influence on, the, um, on this uh, perceived movement. Um, the, um, they, they, there are authors who refer to Elipandus of Toledo, but he, this is not related to the, to the issue of martyrdom. It's, it's related in, to, 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 other, to other issues of theology. So it, it's because not. There was a strong heresiological subtext to what you were saying. Yeah. I was wondering but but it's, 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 not, it, it's not Christological. So the, the theological subtext would be related to other miracles. Is the religion of Islam polytheistic? And is there a persecution? This would be the, the theological subject. It would not be related to, um, to the natures of Christ or the, the Trinity. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, the, the, the history of, of Pelagius is well, absolutely fascinating. Uh, and uh, you put it uh, in, in the context of the um, ascetic literature, the ascetic uh, tradition. Yeah. Uh, uh, but this part of the ascetic tradition is strongly material. Uh, so uh, uh, obviously we have uh, uh, Anthony uh, fighting against demons, but, but it is to show uh, uh, um, Anthony as, as a new martyr. And, and probably when you when we're talking about the elements of the uh, of the image of, uh, of Pelagius, the young, uh, chaste, 
uh, uh, well, sexual advances of the uh, of the powerful, parisia and and the death. Well, that that well, it resembles very much Agatha or Lucia uh, 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 or Agnes, yeah, probably yeah. Even, even more than than Anthony, which ultimately brings us back to the martyrial uh, literature. And it's probably uh, uh, I was thinking about it that, that, that uh, even in, in in this context, so so essentially nothing. Nothing dramatic happens in the, in the country at the, uh, at the time, but uh, 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 it is uh, it is the temptation uh, uh, that, that uh, Christianity very frequently encountered. I mean, to present any uh, well, uh, Eric was working on it uh, to, to present an, any conflict uh, as uh, well in the using the, the rhetoric of the of the martyrdom and and persecution is just so much more powerful than anything else. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it is a good point that perhaps it, it would be better to point to Agnes, Lucia, and other female mm -hmm. martyrs. Uh, yeah, and the Rasuid, of course, uh, is also famous for for writing uh, Latin drama. So she she returns to the the classical past, so to speak, and uh, she recreates um, um, a Christian Latin literature in in this convent of Gandasan. So we, we don't know how, how how she was informed about this. Um, Development of Pelagius, uh, perhaps she um, uh, it may be related to, to embassies exchanged within the Etonian court and uh, Gorba, but this mm -hmm. is slightly later. So mm -hmm. the, the famous embassy of uh, John of Gorsa is, is, is later than this. Uh, but apparently, um, for for an Etonian nun, um, the um, Islamic Spain provided a backdrop to construct um, in, in modern form of, of Christian performance, mm -hmm. not. Um, not not uh, set in, in antiquity, but uh, mm -hmm. a, a return yes. to to the classical tradition, yeah. and this return we do see also in other areas, non theological areas, where she imitates Latin drama, and um, so she she has an, a, a secular side to this mm -hmm. Latin drama, and there's a religious side, and both are a return to some sort of classical tradition, mm -hmm. which is reenacted in the present, mm -hmm. in the present. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Uh, so yes, um, my question I think picks up on what you're just talking to to Robert about with the the Pelagius story, um, but particularly as it's presented by Rosvita. Um, <clears throat> the you know obviously you sketch this hagiographical discourse that failed, which is an interesting contrast already to what Marie Celine was presenting. Um, but you know one could understand why for, for the preservation of this in northern Spain, you know Islam is 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 right next door. It's a it's a Going concern that, that you deal you deal with in Saxony it is not right so you're I think you're starting to answer this in terms of the classical and the recreation of a, a, a late Roman Christian sort of past but I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about why this is a useful story for Rosvita and the the stakes of Islam in particular in Saxony in in such a radically different context but also in a Saxony that is itself fairly recently Christian. Um, and I was just wondering if you could talk about that part. Yeah, the last part of your question brings me back to what I mentioned yesterday uh, uh, when I was referring to the transfer of relics. Uh, there are no Atenian saints, no, no, no Frankish saints right. uh, that suffered martyrdom under Charlemagne's uh, expansion. So they instead they, um, they, they used Roman martyrs and uh, transferred relics from the Roman catacombs to, to, to Saxony. Yeah. So apparently, uh, sainthood for, for the Etonians is located um, in, 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 in foreign lands uh, or in the past. So they, they have to use ancient relics taken from Rome, and they for, for modern times they refer to to the south, to um, to, to 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 the Islamic environment. And uh, I'm not sure. I mean, she, she, Rosita seems to be aware that it's an imperial context. The the Umayyad ruler is not a uh, enemy of she is presented as a imperial ruler. So the he, he is called uh, the, the name Abdurrahman is mentioned. So the, the caliphal name Al Nasir is not mentioned, but she, she does refer to his name Abdurrahman. And she, but she is aware that he's imperial ruler. So apparently this is a, a match for a German Germany for a for for a, a kingdom that has imperial pretension. So may be perceived as an equal. And of course, looking to the other side, uh, it's the, um, the time when Otto the, uh, the first is trying to get a Byzantine bride for his son, uh, Otto the second, and he gets Teofan, who is only the niece of the co-emperor, but still, they, 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 there's a 
there are attempts to 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 uh, to present Etonian Germany as a sort of imperial power on a power with the other more ancient and more prestigious imperial powers. And whereas Otto the first does this with the this merit project referring to the Santan court and getting to open and maybe Razuit trying, on the other hand, to look, look to look to the imperial power of the West, uh, the the of course the first quotation, the Urbs Augusta, so the um, the so image of Imperial Rome transferred to Cordoba, and uh, this is presented as being um, as, as a, a, a rulership on for preparing uh, the the aspirations of uh, the East Frankish kingdom that mm -hmm. wants to be an imperial power. So um, well we might situate this in the this triangle between Byzantium, Cordoba and uh, the Ottonian wilderness, but there's not really an imperial center. So it's it's sort of ironic because uh, we, we don't have an imperial city in, uh, in the 10th century Germany. And uh, I think Geoffrey who suffered greatly when she came from, from Constantinople to the Ottonian wilderness. But still in the wilderness, they are trying to compete with the imperial centers in the East and in the West. But I think I didn't answer the first part of your question, did I? Um, well, I get it was it was more sort of about the you know the, the that failure of a hagiographical discourse, yeah. um, and it's just an interesting contrast. You know why why did they get it so wrong? You know they make they clearly miss their audience. The the, the two early authors, Longius and Albanus, yeah, yeah. They, they they it's very curious to observe what, when they get attention in the Middle Ages. It's not very well known. It starts studies start suddenly. Or not so suddenly in the 16th century, when Ambrosio de Morales discovers the manuscript of uh, Logio's works, which is um, lost nowadays. So we just only have the transcription of the 16th century. And then it is used to, to, to conceptualize Spanish history, Spanish orthodoxy, who belongs to, the, to Spain, who uh, may be counted as a Spaniard, who is not a Spaniard. The, do Judaism and Islam form part of the Spanish history, or are they outsiders? And all this, when the people become aware of this, uh, they turn to these kinds of sources. But before, uh, these, these sources seem to be disregarded in Spain. Uh, they are rather more studied outside. Yeah. Uh, in, in context where the people have, do not have any direct contact with Islam. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have a, a question, but first I must just protest as an aside in good standing. I, I think it is those two bit Umayyads calling them caliphs is just ludicrous, but okay. Um, you mean after the Rahman? Yes, after the Rahman. Yes. <laughs> anyway, uh, I was just curious. Uh, I found fascinating the interjection of that element of you know the moon faced boy into the story as uh, we'll speak. Uh, tells it, and you seem to interpret that metaphorically, and everyone seems to be talking around that, but to me, I think it's a very striking example of cultural alienation, and one of the major sharp lines of delineation uh, when Christians are looking at Muslims and thinking about why, well, clearly this is some kind of crazy abortion of, an, of a religion if it can endorse all of these practices, and these are genuine practices. I mean, the moon-faced boy, they had plenty of them, so don't you think that it sort of was adopted as a symbol of one of the, the greatest differences between what these societies endorsed and what they didn't endorse? Uh, you know, just as polygamy also became in early modern times this symbol for Westerners of the debauchery of Islam, allegedly. Don't you think there's an element of that in it? I think there is, definitely, yeah. Okay. But they, I think Christian authors would... Um, First of all, I refer back to, to antiquity and to the, the ideal of virginity, purity, and all this. This is always all present and underlying. And now the thing that you have mentioned comes on top of this. So the two go together. And uh, Christians writing in the eighth, ninth, and tenth centuries get sort of new, new examples exemplifying this uh, ancient uh, image of uh, non Christian religions being sort of polygamous. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, but, yeah. this, it actually, but Islam is not that it's not very new. In fact, it, it gets absorbed into, or it, it, it's put into the, the tradition that comes from um, from Greco roman uh, religion and uh, and uh, the um, the perception of, uh, of, of, of paganism. And even as, as I mentioned, this, uh, this uh, sarcastic reference by um, Alvarez to, to yeah, 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 yeah. if you see that even, yeah, Judah, even, even <laughs> Judaism is perceived in the anti-Jewish as being, as being, as being not as 
the, the general and pure uh, as Christianity precedes itself. So I think Islam is put into this tradition, but it's not a new thing. It's rather Islam is just one other heresy. It's, it's, it's the one heresy more, and uh, perceiving Islam in this way also sort of degrades it, or it, it, it's, it's an attempt to, to, to solve the problem. Islam is, is nothing revolutionarily new. It's just an, another heresy, following ancient heresies, non-Christian traditions who are always impure, so like this is your, your opponents with sexual corruption is a compost to look at anyway. Yes, but the difference is they actually did have the moon faced boys in college. That's the difference. <laughs> yeah, they did. But but it's under Agnes, also I've heard it's a purity, and that there are stories about the virgins uh, who preserved their virginity, uh, St. Catherine uh, of Alexandria. Yeah. So there are examples in Roman antiquity. I mean, you, you're, you're right. But still, uh, the, the sexual element is, is there even in later. And that would have been a striking difference for them, a really striking difference. Yeah. Maybe it, 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 is, it, is, it is an additional element, but I don't think it, it's radically different because this, this uh, Christianity has always been presented as the, the, the general and more pure religion. So the, the, the very examples in antiquity, and I think Ratzweet would, 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 would want to, to, to liken the, the new uh, cases to the, the older ones, pushing it in this tradition. So and so he, he is the one to, as I said, to, to adapt the, the, uh, the classical Roman so drama. So you don't think it's a piece of contemporary social commentary or, or mm -hmm. noticing? It may be, but could, could she have known that she, she, she never did she leave at the Gandersen convent, which is in the wilderness. So she may have known, but how can she have known? Stories think, circulate. Stories <laughs> circulate, yeah. But also the, the, the maybe um, what, what's more present to, to Rodvid is the, the, the ancient Roman uh, stories about Agnes, Lucia, and so on. So she may have heard to this newer stories, of course, but still uh, what is more familiar to her would be the, the ancient Roman stories of the virgins uh, preserving her purity. Are there and examples of prepubescent boys or pubescent boys in the, in the stories of Christian martyrs from mm -hmm. our Roman Because mm -hmm. no, no, yeah, yeah, you are right. See, I, ball, yeah. I, I think there's something new here. I I I so use the it. phrase because that's what I'm thinking of for the question. <laughs> so we that's made the light of it. We're three and now over time already, but there are two more questions. So I would like to if we were to make it quick. I'm gonna uh, sacrifice my question for them. I don't want to threaten you know to be between people and the food, but now he's sitting. Uh can we make it food? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes, yes, obviously. From Agnes, and it's yeah. all about uh, childhood uh, inversion, the idea of the yeah. pure face, you know, the face that does not come from uh, knowledge. Uh, mm. knowledge. Yes, yeah, it's a good example. Yeah, yes, and Alalia. Alalia is not a boy, so I agree with that. It's definitely true. Yeah. Uh, this is new. And um, which has really a concern with sexuality. Mm -hmm. uh, really, really, she, she has many other examples of female religion, but there they are just really new. So, we have to find out. My question was about <laughs> um, the, the one is the day uh, we live on uh, from the seventh to the tenth century. Is uh, about purifying um, against Islam. Yeah. But I believe that the experience of uh, Paulus and Barbus and theologians is about purifying Christianity. And their aesthetic behaviors, monastic seclusion, is all about uh, mm, telling the other Christian that they are wrong. And we don't care about converting Muslims and Jews, not even try. No, no, of course not. No. Objective. We want to uphold physical Gothic Christianity or return to it. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. It's all about uh, an agonistic behavior to show the other Christians yes, of how course. they must uh, behave. Yeah. So uh, I believe that the, the, the real discourse is against. Yeah, the other Christians, yes, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. 
nobody there to to admit with their yeah, so, uh, you're right. yeah, yeah, that's what yeah, I was trying to say. That yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a return to it's, uh, the, the return to this Gothic Christianity is a purifica purification of what is actually happening in, in the present when bishops collaborate with the Islamic regime and uh, uh, people should, should withdraw from court, withdraw from the center of town to the outskirts and return to studying the Christian father. So it, that is purification of uh, the uh, of, of, of the of Christianity as it is practiced by the Christian majority. So it's an appeal, as I said, to the Christian majority to follow this example, to leave court life, not to co not collaborate with the Islamic regime, go to the monasteries, study the scriptures, and if they are in uh, mixed, religion, mixed families, to preserve their traditions, and if they can withdraw from these mixed families to um, to, uh, to, to the monastery. And sometimes there are even Christian couples. And so man, man and woman, husband and wife, who go to the monastery and they might care for these, uh, for other children who are not their own. They, they may be their spiritual children or become their spiritual children. So husband and wife who withdraw to a monastery might be in charge of uh, people who withdraw to monasteries. And there are examples for this. Uh, Ologios supports and he writes in support of such people who withdraw from their mixed families into the monastery to be able to live, lead a pure Christian life. So this is all about, this is what it's about. Definitely, I mean, it's not just, um, but, but we, we agree. <laughs> the Islamic uh, faith is not that. No, no, they don't, no. Extremists. Yeah, of course there are extremists, but still there are extremists who know Islam and who, who and you know Arabic very well, because Isaac, the Pacetto Republica, who served for several years at the Islamic court, he knows Arabic very well. Well, he studied for three years in the monastery, but when he comes back to town, he um, pretends, uh, no, no, it's another one, what, um, one of the martyrs, future martyrs, pretends that he will embrace Islam, so he must be speaking Arabic. He, he confronts the judge, and the judge is expecting that he has a convert who is about to convert from Christianity to Islam. So the convert is very worse in Arabic. And then he uh, he uh, switches around and he denounces the prophet and uh, pours uh, curses at Islam, of course, uh, in perfect Arabic. So uh, it's, uh, it is set in an Arabic speaking environment, and the people are very well aware of the of, um, Arabic culture and Islamic religion. And we should continue this discussion. I have one nice.